Introduction to Krylov's Fables by Ivan Andreevich Krylov, selected and translated by C. Fillingham Coxwell, M.D. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Ivan Andreevich Krylov was born in Moscow on February 14, 1768. His father, a military officer, found himself at Orenburg during serious events. The poet Pushkin, in his History of Pugachev's Rebellion, says, Fortunately, in the fortress there was a Captain Krylov, a man of decision and prudence. He at once took command of the garrison and made the necessary dispositions. Pugachev swore to hang not only Krylov but all of his family. Thus for a while seemed destined to death the four-year-old boy who later became the famous fabulist. On leaving the army, the father went with his wife and son to Tver, where he became president of the district court of magistrates. The boy's education fell to the share of his mother, who endeavored to encourage him in his lessons by a reward of a few kopecks. The money, as it amassed, being devoted by the child under her direction to small outlays necessary for his own benefit. Her subsequent plan of getting him educated under a French tutor with the neighboring landowner's children did not turn out well, so the child returned to her care. Although she did not know French, she made her son read in that language before her. When the father died, the mother could get no pension, and the boy, then aged eleven, obtained employment in the chancellery where his father had presided. Ivan's work allowed him plenty of time for talking to the common people in streets and squares and for listening to their conversation, and early impressions so gained became the storehouse whence he drew the racy and characteristic dialogues in his fables. But the mother did not slacken her efforts, and the boy occupied himself eagerly and indiscriminately with a trunk full of books which had belonged to his father. In his fifteenth year he composed the words of a comic opera in rhymed verse, the Kofienitsa, the fortune-teller by means of coffee-grounds, Soon afterwards, under untoward stress of circumstances, the mother set forth to St. Petersburg in the hope of securing a pension for herself and a proper position for Ivan. They arrived in the capital in 1783. Everything was very cheap at the time. Thus this poor but admirable mother paid a servant only two roubles a year in wages. The lad had obtained a place at an annual remuneration of twenty-five roubles, Five years later, Ivan was left parentless, but as long as he lived, the great fabulist could not recall his mother without the deepest emotion. On arriving in St. Petersburg, the youth turned his first composition to good account. A foreigner named Britkov, printer and bookseller, as well as musical devotee, bought the Kafienitsa for sixty paper rubles, or rather for their value in certain volumes of Racine and Moliere which young Krylov preferred to the Voltaire and Crébillon. The great French satirist doubtless influenced him strongly, and he was drawn to the heroes of Greeks and of Rome by Racine, and soon produced a tragedy, Cleopatra. Having submitted this work to the judgment of Dmitrievsky, the famous actor, he called almost every day for the judge's opinion. After several months, Dmitrievsky said that he wished to read the piece with the author, and then explained its grave defects. A second tragedy, Philomena, finished in 1786, had no greater success. After the death of his mother in 1788, Krylov entered the public service, but retired in two years, for he was drawn to literary pursuits and aspired to become an editor. He thought that a periodical printed by himself might bring him independence and fame. For several years he thus busied himself with magazines, the printing establishment, and new pieces for the stage. The Soul's Post, issued monthly, was interesting and carried on brightly, but in the course of a year it ceased from lack of public support. However, Krylov continued the printing business for himself and his partners. In 1792 he brought out a new journal, The Spectator, for which a dramatic author named Klushkin helped to supply articles. Throughout his long career, Krylov used to recall his association with his colleague pleasurably. When this journal stopped, a new one, the St. Petersburg Mercury, took its place, but only lasted a year. It contained several poems by Krylov, marked by literary finish and lively thought. 
He constantly sought for improvement and widened his undertaking, but again betook himself to dramatic composition when Klushkin went abroad. After producing the comedy The Evil of Short Sight and the opera The Americans, both in 1800, and the comedy Ready to Oblige in 1801, he henceforth relinquished journalistic enterprise and became much engrossed with comedies in prose. Little is known of Krylov from 1795 to 1801. That no reference to this period occurs in any of his writings is considered remarkable, for he possessed several gifts, such as painting and great skill on the violin, so that he took part in friendly concerts with the first musicians of the day. Moreover, he enjoyed intimacy with actors, journalists, and contemporary writers. To develop his ability in literature, Krylov learnt Italian and could read freely in that language. He was not strange to the higher society of the capital, which at that time welcomed talented persons, but unfortunately here he acquired a taste for cards, and sought places where he could give way to this weakness unrestrainedly. He would visit some other town in order to meet his companions and indulge in cards although not avaricious, when young he played passionately. At last he grew sick of such an inactive life. The Tsarina Maria Fedorovna recommended him, he being then thirty-two years of age, to the military governor of Riga, Prince Sergei Fedorovich Galitsyn, who employed him as secretary. Here his love of cards continued. He is said to have won a very large sum of money at play, and to have lost it almost as quickly but his love of literature underwent no diminution, and he circulated in manuscript a witticism under the name of Trumpf, founded on the absurdities perpetrated by Germans in their pronunciation of Russian. Two or three years later, Prince Golitsyn, falling into disgrace and retiring to the province of Saratov, persuaded Krylov to accompany him. It suited the poet's disposition to accept the invitation, for he loved a careless existence, and he was glad to observe the country life of a grandee. Here he lived three years, but despite his friendly relations with the prince, his position was not altogether congenial. Thus Krylov could not avoid slight vexations at the hands of various persons who failed to appreciate his qualities and regarded him as useless. Such time as was not taken up by country amusements, social gatherings, and meals, he devoted to the advantage of his host's children. In 1805, after bidding a cordial farewell to Galitsyn, he set out for St. Petersburg to see his old friends and to renew former occupations. Nature had given Krylov an active, acute, and even biting mind. In youth he was carried away by his first thought, whatever it might be, and he was constantly devoted to novelty. This was why, with a widening circle of acquaintance and a reputation among authors, he devoted himself to nothing constantly, and long remained without substantial success in the state service and in the profession of literature. At that time Russian literature flourished in Moscow. Not only Dmitriev, the fabulist, and Karamazin, the distinguished author of A History of Russia, were transforming the nation's language and taste, and attracting a younger generation to their models, but Zhukovsky, the romantic poet and translator of Byron, had already acquired fame. During 1806 Krylov stayed for a time in Moscow, and found pleasure in the society of authors who lived for thought and style. Feeling attracted especially to Dmitriev, and wishing to work at a subject of common interest, he translated La Fontaine's The Oak and the Reed, as well as another fable, and having submitted them was delighted to gain Dmitriev's warmest approval. The senior was so pleased with them that he recommended his future rival to devote himself to this form of poetry. Returning to St. Petersburg, Krylov developed his former passion for the theatre. His three stage pieces, printed in 1807, were probably prepared previously, it may be during his residence with Golitsyn, the comedies The Fashion Shop, and A Lesson for Daughters, are animated by Krylov's strong disapproval for the prevailing passion among Russians for everything French. His fairy opera, Ilya the Hero, appeared in 1807. In the same year the poet published some new fables and poems entitled A Message on the Use of the Passions and The Guns and the Sails. 
In 1808, when forty years of age, Krylov recognized his vocation and concentrated all his strength on one form of poetic activity. Zhukovsky inserted several of Krylov's translations from La Fontaine in The Messenger of Europe, and is quoted by Pletnev as saying, La Fontaine, who did not invent a single fable of his own, is honored nevertheless as an original poet. The reason is that while borrowing the ideas of others, La Fontaine did not borrow his charm of style, nor his feelings, nor his truly poetical pictures, nor the simplicity with which he adorned, and so to say made his own that which he borrowed. The story belonged to La Fontaine, and in a fable, in verse, the story is the chief thing. The same critic continues, The imitator in verse can be original, while the translator in prose is a slave. The translator in verse is a rival. An explanation of this remark concerning rivalry is that educated Russians could compare the French and Russian versions, for instance, of The Hermit and the Bear, which Krolov improved materially. Moreover, Zhukovsky was probably thinking of translations in which is preserved little more than the spirit of the original. Happily, the Russian fabulist wrote numerous fables for which he was indebted to no one, and his superiority to his French predecessor in the matter of originality soon became absolute. A close acquaintance formed at this time with A. H. Olenin had a great influence on Krylov's further fate. In Olenin's house, where contemporary Russian writers obtained a hearty welcome, Krylov was recognized more as a fabulist than dramatist, and he determined henceforth to devote all his poetical activity to a form of fable full of wisdom and charm. The first edition, consisting of twenty-three fables, was issued in 1808. The book sold rapidly. We possess now two hundred and one fables, and according to the poet's own account in the edition of 1843, only thirty were borrowed from other writers, the others belonging to himself both as to story and treatment. During the four years which elapsed between the appearance of the first edition of the Fables and Krylov's entrance into an appointment at the Imperial Public Library, his attraction towards the stage cooled remarkably. The former dramatic writer, an unvarying spectator of each new performance, did not for ten consecutive years visit the theatre. Derjavin, the poet, himself appreciated Krylov's new talent, and the latter now belonged to a group of the best authors. In 1809, a society of lovers of the Russian language was formed in the house of the singer Filietsa, and as most of the members belonged to the Russian Academy, Krylov, in 1810, was elected to the Academy, but his genius did not obtain much assistance from any learned meetings. He attended only on formal occasions. When the Imperial Public Library was opened in 1811, A. H. Olenin was appointed director, and the posts of the secretaries and their assistants were allotted only to persons eminent in literature, which rule was observed for several years so that such men as Gnedich, the translator of the Iliad, and Lobanov, the translator of Racine's Iphigeni and Phaedra, became associated, Krylov was given the post of assistant to Sopikov, the librarian in the Department of Russian Books. The poet's former acquaintance, Brikov, who had purchased from him the Kofienitsa, also entered the library service, and as he had carefully preserved the manuscript of that precocious production, he was able to return it to the eager and now distinguished author. Apartments were allotted to the assistants in the chief building of the library. From the beginning of this epoch, Krylov began a new life, quiet, monotonous, and free from care, and it was continued till he retired after thirty years in the service. In 1816, he succeeded to the appointment hitherto held by Sopikov. His fame had already become national, and in the first year of his service the Tsar Alexander I conferred upon him, as a supplement to his salary, a pension of fifteen hundred paper rubles, an amount doubled eight years afterwards. To the solitary and the easy-going Krylov there was no reason for worry, and he lapsed into poetic inactivity. His appointment and the society of a narrow select circle suiting him thoroughly, he duly discharged his not very onerous duties, but developed no fresh tastes. 
Nevertheless, he continued to compose from time to time new fables. He kept aloof from general society, perhaps because he did not feel within him sufficient freshness of force to make his way among people successfully. But he was not forgotten, and there were many new editions of his fables, the last, that of 1843, being undertaken and finished by himself. Foreigners, as well as Russians, recognized Krylov's merit. But an especial honor fell to his share in 1831, when Tsar Nicholas I included his bust among New Year's gifts to the Grand Duke, who afterwards became Tsar Alexander II. Three years later, the poet's pension from the imperial treasury was again doubled, quote, in consideration of services rendered to Russian literature. End quote. He continued to lead an apparently inactive life, though probably his mind was often occupied with the selection of subjects for his fables and with deciding the best form of their treatment. When he was on official duty at the appointed hour, the heavy figure of the famous fabulist appeared among the assistants and slowly proceeded to his official place. These assistants usually were on duty in turn for twenty-four hours. Krylov never asked for exemption nor did the good-hearted one, as he was called, ever become irritable like many another during the trying summer weather. He was fond of making himself comfortable on a sofa and of killing time by reading stupid novels, even more than once. Nevertheless, for the more efficient distribution of the numerous brochures existing in the Russian department, he invented cases in the form of thick books and so conveniently classified ephemeral literature. He had, moreover, to work harder when he was given, as assistant, a poet of an easy-going temperament similar to his own. Domestic life called out his most striking peculiarities. He troubled little, if at all, about cleanliness and order, his establishment being served by a hired woman and a girl, her daughter. Nobody had any idea of wiping dust from the furniture or from anything else. Of three fair-sized rooms looking on to the street, the middle room was a salon, the one on the left remained unused, and the last, cornering on the Nevsky Prospect, served as the poet's living room. Here, behind a partition, stood a bed. The poet's seat was on a sofa before a small table in the light part of the room. He had no study or writing table, and it was hard to find pen, ink, and paper. He begged affably that visitors should be seated, but it was not always possible for them to find a suitably clean place. Krylov constantly smoked a cigar with a mouthpiece, guarding his eyes from the heat and smoke. The cigar went out continually, and then he rang. The girl, coming out of the kitchen across the salon, brought a thin wax candle without a candlestick, dropped some wax on the table, and fixed the candle in an upright position before the poet. In the middle room, a small part of the windows was almost always open, and Krylov, by throwing grains of corn on the floor, tamed the pigeons from the great bazaar called the Gostyeny Dvor, so that they were as much at home in his rooms as they were in the street. The resulting condition of the place may be imagined. He rose rather late. Then, after enjoying a cigar and a novel, he passed the time sometimes with his friends, till he set out to dine at the English club, so named for the nationality of the founder. A doze, or cards, followed dinner, and next he returned home, though occasionally he visited Olenin. To strange visitors, whether literary or otherwise, he generally showed great politeness, but he never liked to enter into arguments, as he thought people changed their opinions chiefly according to their experiences. He was even apt to agree in a mechanical way with others, though his sagacity and fineness of perception remained developed to the highest degree. The poet was imprudent in the use of food. For several years, before his last illness, he did not allow himself to eat many dishes, but moderation was seldom his virtue, with the two or three which he allowed himself. It was his custom to pass the summer oftener in towns than in the country, leaving only to spend perhaps a fortnight with the Olenins. The Tsarina Maria Fyodorovna sometimes invited him to Pavlovsk, and the poet, on such occasions, never forgot to observe the old custom, beloved by the Empress, according to which men powdered the hair. She always acknowledged the attention by a few gracious but jesting words. It was in Pavlovsk that he wrote his charming fable, The Cornflower, 
which he left as a mark of deep gratitude to his crowned benefactress in one of the albums provided for visitors in the Rose Pavilion. At the Empress's dinner-table another poet, Kapnist, once whispered to Krylov, "'You are eating enough for ten. Refuse just once, Ivan Andreevich, and I give the Empress a chance of inviting you to partake.' "'Well, but if she does not invite me,' answered Krylov, and continued to heap up his plate." The best indications of the poet's manner of life and customs and inclinations are the stories related of him by his intimate contemporaries. Gnedich relates that to his astonishment he found that Krylov, even at the age of fifty, had quietly studied Greek for two years. Having fulfilled his purpose, the poet let his new pursuit lapse, except occasionally to look at Aesop. Once, when Krylov called on a certain acquaintance, the servant said that his master was asleep. "'No matter,' answered Krylov. "'I will wait.' And, passing into the drawing-room, he lay down on the sofa and slumbered also. Meantime, the gentleman of the house woke, and entering the room, there found, to his astonishment, a complete stranger. "'What can I do for you?' Krylov asked him. "'Allow me to put the same question to you,' was the reply, "'because this is my house.' "'How is that? N lives here.' No, I am living here now, but Mr. N. may have lived here before me. After a little further conversation, the owner discovered Krylov's identity, and, being delighted to see such a distinguished man, begged him to stay. By no means, answered Krylov, I shall go, but at any rate we have had a look at each other. And he departed. It is clear that the fabulist was capable of indulging in a certain bluntness and directness of speech, but in spite of his wisdom, as expressed in his fables, he was no cold philosopher. On the contrary, he was swayed by very lively feelings. When N. E. Gnedich, who had been Krylov's intimate friend, left the service and retired on a pension, the poet suddenly began to avoid him, and even passed without speaking. However, after two weeks he came and bowed his head and said, "'Nicholas Ivanovitch, forgive me. For what, Ivan Andreevitch?' I am aware of a coldness, but I do not know its cause. Oh, pity me, honoured friend. I envied your pension and your good fortune, which you deserve. I abhor the feelings which entered my soul. Gnedich embraced him, and the past was forgotten. Krylov was well aware how greatly his talents were appreciated by his countrymen, but his head was not turned by adulation. He assumed no airs. Once he assured a friend that the first printed praise of any of his works had an immense influence on him. I will say openly that I was given to laziness when young, and I cannot get rid of it now. I wrote a certain trifle, and a printed commendation, having aroused in me a wish for more, I began to exert myself. Let posterity judge if I have done anything. Only, I think, if that publication had not praised him, Ivan Krylov would not have written as he wrote afterwards. Besides originality of ideas and highly developed artistic sense, a conscientious desire to do his best governed Krylov, as in instance by the corrections made in different editions of his fables. He was inclined to display a graceful humility. One day, after dinner, Olenin remarked to him, "'No writer equals you in fame. Your fables have passed through ten editions.' "'That is not surprising,' was the answer. "'My fables are read by children, and the little ones destroy whatever they get hold of.' Yet he knew his worth, and could show a rugged sturdiness, which scarcely befits a courtier. Once, when the imperial family was at the Anichkov Palace, and Krylov lived at the public library, the Emperor Nicholas I met the poet on the Nevsky Prospekt. "'Ah, Ivan Andreevich, how do you do? It is long since we saw you.' said the Tsar pleasantly. "'Some little time, Your Majesty,' was the answer, "'and yet we are neighbours. His qualities of determination and persistence, combined with a complete absence of truckling to the great, are exemplified in the following anecdote. The Empress Alexandra Fedorovna once gave Krylov, it is said, a porcelain cup and cover artistically adorned in cobalt, and then, recollecting that it was a gift from the Empress Maria Fedorovna, requested that it might be returned. When Krylov heard the command, he answered, Inform Her Majesty that I will not return the cup, because it has belonged to a dead person. Receiving the message, the Empress exclaimed, What is to be done with the old man? Let him keep it. 
However, the cup was restored later. Krylov's humor and wit made him much sought after in the middle period of his life. At a gathering, a person was mentioned who possessed an income of more than six million rubles. "'That is enormous,' said Krylov. "'It is as if I had a blanket thirty yards long.' But when moved by jealousy, that not in common bane of literary genius, Krylov could excel in roughness. During a literary evening, A. C. Pushkin read his Boris Gurunov. All were in ecstasies, except Krylov, who seemed indifferent. "'Is it true, Ivan Andreevich, that my Boris does not please you?' asked Pushkin. "'No, it is very well. It pleases me. Only listen, and I will tell you an anecdote. A certain preacher said that each of God's creatures is perfect. A humpback, with a hump in front and behind, came to the pulpit, and, pointing to his affliction, asked, "'Am I then perfect?' The preacher, astonished at the deformity, answered, "'Yes, you are a perfect humpback. So is your drama, Alexander Sergeyevich, most excellent of its sort.' An atmosphere of respect and fame did not spoil him, and he remained extremely simple and approachable. One thing which bound him more than ever to the Ilyenians was the death of his brother Leo, whom he had supported in the provinces. Krylov, who was tall and of massive proportions, with a face expressive of good nature and sly humor, was never married, an early attachment not having recommended itself to the young lady's father because of the poet's narrow means. But in his hermit-like old age he took pleasure in teaching little children to read and write, and in hearing their musical lessons. Moreover, he adopted his goddaughter's family and domiciled them with himself, feeling cheered when the children dined and had tea with him or when they played in his room. On the seventieth anniversary of his birth, various literary men celebrated the jubilee of the Russian fabulist, although already more than fifty years had elapsed since the appearance of Philomena. A committee was formed to arrange the festival, which was attended by about three hundred distinguished persons. Before the dinner, Pletnyev and another went to fetch Krylov, who had received as yet but vague news of the event. Olyanin welcomed him at the reception, and the Minister of Public Instruction, after fixing a star upon the poet's breast, led him to a special chamber where two young Grand Dukes congratulated him. By all this Krylov was moved to tears. In 1841 he finally retired with a pension of about six hundred pounds a year, and crossed over to live in the Vasily Ostrov. Forward he went out into the world less than ever, and became still heavier, though corpulence had long ago overtaken him. But on two occasions he appeared at masked balls in palaces, and in costume, recited one of his fables before the imperial party. Unfortunately, his handwriting laterly became illegible, because he loved to copy out his corrected fables. All his life the poet enjoyed fine health, thanks to the simplicity in which he was brought up. Neither his excessive appetite nor his sedentary life had injured him. Even two slight attacks of paralysis hardly affected his mode of existence, and he remained astonishingly calm in the face of death. When a friend, as it were accidentally, spoke of calling in priestly aid, he asked Krylov if he were a skeptic. The reply was, "'You will judge from this. Long ago, when paralysis was threatening my hands, I went to a doctor and showed them to him. He asked me the same question that you have asked, and I answered no. The doctor then told me I might become paralyzed, and suggested that I should never eat any meat.' "'You, of course, followed his advice?' inquired the friend. "'Yes. I followed it for two months, and then I thought no more about it. So you can judge whether I am a skeptic. A fire occurred in a neighboring house, and Krylov's servants bestirred themselves to preserve his most important papers and effects. But contrary to his custom, for conflagrations had always greatly interested and excited him, he paid no attention to it. He ordered tea and lit a cigar, and later leisurely dressed. Then, looking at the terrible scene, he said he would not move. Krylov was especially fond of Russian dishes, and his friends often provided them for him. His last illness succeeded to indulgence in a rich dish, and although the doctors could not save him, he preserved his cheerfulness, and even humorously related the following little fable to a bystander. A peasant intended to offer for sale a load of dried fish, 
His horse was worn out and weak. Nevertheless, the peasant loaded him to the utmost. The neighbor laughed and predicted disaster, while the peasant said nothing. But on the road he became convinced that you can overload a horse, even with dried fish. So with me. I thought some woodcock would do me no harm, but just the opposite. I'm done for. He received the last consolations of religion in a grateful and eager spirit, and passed away in his seventy-seventh year. He was buried in the Alexander Nevsky convent beside Gnedich, and not far from Karazmin. The day after his death a thousand persons received a copy of the edition of the fables, which had been in preparation under his own supervision since 1843. On the first page was printed an offering in memory of Ivan Alendreyevich, by his wish. St. Petersburg, 1844, November 9th. This precious gift was chiefly an acknowledgment and expression of gratitude to those taking part in the celebration of his jubilee. Under the highest patronage, a public subscription was opened for erection of a memorial, and a great bronze statue on a granite pedestal was placed in the summer gardens, where the children to whom he has given so much pleasure frequently play. Episodes from his best fables are depicted on bas-relief. There he sits, clad in his everyday surtout, which beneath and around him are representatives of the numerous beasts, birds, and insects of his fables. End of a reading from the introduction. Recording by Kevin Davidson. www.blogordie.com Chapters 1 to 10 of Kriloff's Fables. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Kevin Davidson. Kriloff's Fables by Ivan Andreevich Kriloff. Selected and translated by C. Fillingham Coxwell, M.D. Chapter 1. THE MICE IN COUNCIL Once on a time the mice aspired, through deeds to glitter, despising every cat of either sex. They would the lives of cook and mistress vex. What topic than a mouse's glory could be fitter? To hear it folk would strain their necks. A council should be called, whither must come no sitter whose tale was not of special length. Tales were not wrong, if as the body long. A mouse with well-developed tales a sound adviser, in all things wiser than nibblers of less stately kind. Here to extenuate, in honour let us mention, that to a man's attire and beard we give attention when we are critics of his mind. T'was held by free consent and common feeling that none but long-tailed mice might tread the council room. Thus, if in fight any had met her doom as to her tail, there could be no appealing. Taillessness was of folly a revealing or careless dealing. There was no other course to choose. Tales lost, must warn the mice, no tales to lose. So matters were arranged, and duly came the meeting. As soon as darkest hours occurred in the great meal-bin, talk was heard. The mice were plans completing, but scarcely they the task assail, when, lo, arrives a rat without a tail. Observing this, a tiny mouse, and youthful, nudges a gray-haired mate, and gently asks her by what fate a tailless rat is there. Let her be truthful. What then has happened to our law? Loud say, I pray, that he must instantly withdraw, for sure our people all dislike a crippled creature. How should he prove of use, ere of advantage be, that could not keep himself from a misfortune free? His presence in debate will be an evil feature. The elder answered thus, 
Be sage and not a fool. He was my friend at school. Chapter 2. The Pike Against a pike was lodged the plaint. He'd made the pond a home unpleasant. It was a reason for restraint, and that the rogue in person should be present. He from the water in a tub was brought. The magistrates nearby collecting in a rich meadow pasture sought. Here is a list of those the captive's case affecting. Two asses gathered there, two ancient sorry horses, and of goats a pair, while also, as a general inspector, a fox was of the prosecution the director. Among the people, rumor said, this pike supplied the fox with fish his table spread. Nevertheless, the judges were in no way partial, letting no wile or trend of vulpine tricks obscure their crystal vision. They must fix upon a judgment free from politics. Against the guilty one their forces marshal, and sinners to deter, suspend him from a beam. "'My lord,' pronounced the fox, "'I am for death as sentence. Hanging is over good, despite the rogue's repentance. The punishment should be remarkable, extreme, to make a wicked life both dangerous and frightful. The pike should now be drowned.' A verdict rightful, exclaimed the judges, surely no way spiteful, and threw the pike into a stream. Chapter 3. The Eagle and the Mole O'er great forest regions flying, a splendid eagle sped, preceding far his mate. They purposed on a mighty oak to wait, until among the branches should be lying, within a nest a brood derived from mutual love. There they would tend their fledglings through sweet days of summer, calls upward a fresh comer, who views from earth the king above. This ancient tree is hardly fitted for a dwelling, through rotting roots is insecure, will topple, scape the woodman's felling, so utters from a hole a voice demure. But if a sovereign bird should take from a benighted and abject mole advice, who then would praise in future days eagles keen-sighted? How dared a mole reflect on higher beings' ways so dryly? The monarch sternly glanced, but nothing said, would hear no little mole return to work instead. Deftly prepared a future bed, and rest for one he honored highly, and welcomed with her soon precocious eaglets wily. What next? It happened once at dawn, that to the nest flew with a tiny fawn, as a rich breakfast in his talons, the fond father, the oak, as he, alas, must gather, had with a crash both mate and young to earth down drawn. O oh, anguish, O oh, what dread affliction, grievously am I cursed. Fate for my pride has sent me punishment the worst. Because I would not heed a wise and shrewd prediction, yet how, in truth, could I expect an humble mole would sage advice to me direct? If you had not despised my message, was muttered from below, you might have used my presage. I dig my holes beneath the earth, learn much of life well nigh from birth, of news concerning trees, for moles there's never dearth. CHAPTER Four: THE BEAR AMONG THE BEES In spring the beasts, perhaps with thoughts of nectar, appoint a surly bear of beehives their inspector, such officer alert to be and true, bruins for honey over eager of honesty, but meagre. Yet brutes possess a curious point of view. The post, although enthralling, does not suit every one, and so, in fun, the bear assumes the calling, but harm is done. Since Bruin in his den the honeycombs collected, until the beasts, 
by rage affected for law pronounced it an affair ere long much nettled the judges settled the wicked rogue should spend the winter in his lair many are here of justice lovers yet none the stolen combs recovers from one that evil boldly perpetrates so long the happy self disporter in his warm comfortable quarter calmly his taste for honey sates an expedition new awaits chapter v the peasant and the sheep a peasant hauled a sheep to court and pressed against her there a serious objection a fox as judge is ready for a false detection hears plaintiff first and then defendant in retort taking in turn each point and cool though others stammer he seeks the cause of all the clamour the peasant says my lord when visiting my yard i found two chickens missing twas an early morning only their bones and feathers served me as warning this sheep alone was there on guard the sheep replies no strange event my slumbers marred prithee the evidence of neighbors don't discard against me never was brought a charge of thieving or other crime at any time as to my tasting flesh tis notion past conceiving here are the fox's judgments from their earliest weaving i no way can accept the pleadings of this sheep because all rogues are skilled to keep their wicked purposes from others tis clear from plaintiff's words that on the given night defendant held the foul house well in sight now who can think she smothers an inborn wish for viand's choice so i decide by conscience sacred voice she cannot have admitted hens were her unfitted her guilt is clear and lets the peasant win the carcass goes to me and he will get the skin chapter six the oak and the reed once a majestic oak said to a little reed weakling you surely are with nature disenchanted to bear a tiny sparrow would your powers exceed if but a puff of wind to stifle folk be granted forthwith you quiver shake and losing strength so far in misery lean over i'm pained to view your prostrate length i like caucasian heights give mortals shade and cover protect them fully from the sun's infuriate rays can laugh at whirlwinds and the hurricanes displays by my erectness men amaze as if by vast inviolable might befriended but as for you your life is restlessness unended had you but grown in some fine neighbourhood famous for forest trees enriched with oaken wonders i would have guarded you even when heaven thunders but cruel nature set you near no wood led you to troublous shores of blusterous dominions which little care or wreck concerning your opinions you are compassionate the little reed replied but prithee do not grieve i can my lot abide for me no storms or whirlwinds matter i yield but neither break nor shatter the tempests cause me little harm perhaps they more yourself discomfort and alarm tis true that till this hour unaltered in position you have withstood the gale's ambition survived its doughty blows need never humbly bend well let us wait the end the reed has scarcely thus clear spoken when from the far tempestuous north wind swept with rain and hail and noisy hurried forth at first the haughty oak stood firm unbroken but soon the gusts drove with redoubled force and shrieked up wrenching in their course the lofty form which strove toward heaven dauntless hearted while with its roots it touched the graves of shades departed chapter seven the gnat and the shepherd relying on his dogs a shepherd calmly slept till spying him a serpent hither crept 
from neath a bush with motion sure and steady then brandishing its tongue its fangs made ready a gnat adventurous sly scheming to outwit sharply the sleeper bit who woke in time twin actions to commit he slew the snake as well the gnat with force unfit being dazed with sleep as after a draught heady in human life's strange circling eddy should but a weakling dare meaning however well to ope to truth the eyes of persons stronger his chastisement will certain be and longer than here befell chapter eight the chest when obstacles arrest our steps and courage test oh then without a good beginning we've little chance of winning home from the maker's hands was brought a handsome chest whose neatness exquisite and workmanship astounded by its intrinsic charms observers all confounded but soon into the room a skilled mechanic pressed and looking at the box said yes the scheme is hidden you will not find the lock though i will hunt it out if only I am bidden, but kindly do not at me mock. The chest will open, for its secret I'll discover of things mechanical. I'm somewhat of a lover. Keen for his task, he brave began, oft turned the box to find the plan. Ere long, perplexed, his head he scratches. Importance unto this small nail or knob attaches, looks at the chest, and still can find a way to use his mind. Folk whisper amongst themselves, and even grow unkind. Hear all he to their ears can offer. Not here, not so, no there. Yet looks he at the coffer, perspires, and grows fatigued. At last, far from the box he passed. Had no way guessed the truth, when trying first to win it. The chest was open at that minute. Chapter 9 The Fox and the Marmot Why now, upon a journey, art thou set intently? So to a fox a marmot spoke. Dear friend, I flee from evil folk. Falsely accused, depart, they used me pestilently. Thou knowest I was in the poultry yard a judge. There toiled and lost my health as might a common drudge. Mere scraps of food as mine could number, Obtained no proper slumber, Will never more the place encumber With my superior form. Just for a moment think, Oh, what will happen if to slander people sink? Do I extort? Am I grown old and doting? Pray, has it ever come within thy careful noting That I to weakness am any way inclined? Answer on, carefully reflecting, I've thought it strange thy muzzle, when inspecting, thereon a little down to find. What worries has the office-holder? The cost of living sadness makes him older. But suddenly, becoming bolder, he enters on a costly game. His wife seeks fame, no fortune they've come into, and yet to build a house, buy freeholds, they begin to. How can his salary provide for splendid shows? You will not far from truth be straying, nor deeply erring if you're saying, Some specks of down appear upon his nose. Chapter 10 The Wolves and the Sheep In danger from such wolves the lambs were sure to perish. Hence, though delaying long at last the rulers of the beasts thinking the sheep to cherish debated how their votes to cast and then to needed action passed tis true that at the council wolves were in great number but none has proved in wolves kind feelings always slumber here's the truth exact wolves have been gazed at oft that with a manner almost pensive display before their prey a nature soft, having well gorged themselves, are inoffensive. They therefore properly may on committees sit, 
as sheep should not to misery submit. So wolves have rights, at times may benefit. The conference is held in a deserted valley, whither the beasts to argue rally, with effort real, construct a novel law, devoid of any seeming flaw. As soon as any wolf the flock shall worry, a sheep forthwith to him shall hurry, desist not, though she fear him much, but lightly on the paw him touch, and lead him to a wood where one of several judges well settling each complaint in every righteous cause, nor time nor labor grudges. I've noted since, I've grown with all acquaint, that though the sheep should let no wolf annoy them, yet that whoever's right in a dispute, the savage wolves, fast speeding in pursuit, of sheep destroy them. End of chapters 1 to 10Chapters 11 to 20 of Krylov's Fables by Ivan Andreevich Krylov, selected and translated by C. Fillingham Coxwell, M.D. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter 11 The Elephant as Governor A ruler should be wise. With hoodwinked eyes he scarce will notice wrongs or judgment exercise. An elephant was called to government's emprise. Now all his tribe are patient, trusty, and sagacious, and yet in every race comes freaks vexatious. This monarch gracious, of simple mind, oft foolish was, though kind, even to hurt a fly, for him were painful, being of duties ne'er disdainful. The potentate receives from timid sheep his prayer, the wolves no more the skins from off our backs should tear. O oh, thieves! he bellows forth, what hideous transgression to rob and keep in your possession. Our father, say the wolves, we humbly would explain, do we not understand that for the winter season we were to tax the sheep and comforts thus obtain? Therefore, if they lament, tis surely without reason, we ask a little, but from each a single pelt. Yet they have murmured, angry felt. Justice, replies the ruler, is a jewel. I cannot suffer you in aught to do a wrong. More than a skin from each were cruel. One only may to you belong. Chapter 12 The Man and His Shadow A certain joker wished his shadow to embrace. He darted out, it flew. He added to his pace, it yet advanced, so he began to race. The shadow quicker sped, however fast he scurried, as if a ghost it scaped attack. Then my original went swiftly back. He looked around, already after him it hurried. Ladies, I many times have heard, What? No, tis not of you, the thought's absurd, that fortune often thus to treat mankind is stirred. Here's one who wastes his time and labor, trying with all his might her favors to obtain. Another uses her, as if he were insane. To him she's truer than is any loving neighbor. CHAPTER Thirteen, THE EAGLE AND THE BEE Seeing a little bee at work among the flowers, an eagle ceased his flight, contemptuously to mutter, Poor thing! You sadly waste your powers, that skilled and wise so tirelessly can flutter thousands in summer like you in a common home, model with care the honeycomb, but who allots to each her merit? The taste is strange that you inherit to labor throughout life, and have but what in view, to die obscure, with all who trifling ends pursue, weak might you little me resemble when on a wondrous course i feel my pinions tremble lone or where mates neath clouds assemble i everywhere awaken fear i and the terror reaches even feathered creatures two shepherds must be wakeful if flocks i'm near such time the fleetest hinds on plains will not appear catching a glimpse of me 
wear troubled features the bee replies to thee high honor now and praise zeus lavishes on thee his gifts with hand unsparing but knowledge that my toil helps others me repays what is renown to one for it uncaring i feel a certain pleasure when the comb preparing for in it many a drop of my own honey stays chapter fourteen the liar home coming from a far-off land a count perhaps a prince of bearing rather grand with an especial friend along a road was walking vaunted his travels in a voice serene with idle tales embellished objects he had seen said other folk had seldom been to spots of which he now was talking a wretched hole is this sometimes a bitter north wind's blowing the sun's invisible or like a furnace glowing but there one's lot is bliss the recollection brings me pleasure you wear no furs the time scarce measure mark not the seasons nor the shades of night but all the year enjoy entrancing summer light tis needless there the seed to scatter nay if a crop ne'er ripens little does it matter for instance once in rome a cucumber i saw o nature's law thou art of much the source and fountain you scarcely will believe twas like a mountain how great a rarity the friend amused replies and adds o'er earth are wide distributed these wonders but not to seek them out were haply wise indeed we now approach a vast sensation and seldom tis that one on such a marvel blunders in any place or nation spanning the river here a bridge of curious class exists upon our road and o'er it we shall pass tis of peculiar action on every liar who responds to its attraction for ere he get halfway across he disappears and friends bewail his loss but never gloss unwelcome truths and you could step it boldly now tell me is the water deep the banks are steep look who could view the prospect of immersion coldly your cucumber at rome was tall i do not doubt large as you say a mountain or a hill about let's say a house in order not the truth to flout hard to receive it not easy to believe it ah yes this bridge is strange to thrash the topic out it bears unwillingly vain story-tellers why only in the recent spring it slew mysteriously some writers or news-sellers that to it long were seen to cling a house-sized cucumber must be the oddest thing prodigious weird if not exaggerated perhaps i have not well related but you shall hear the facts anew not of a size extreme is every dwelling nor all excelling it may be great enough for two with ease and comfort true but surely as should be repeated your cucumber was monstrous if it grew till folk within it could be seated our bridge is well of such a kind that liars taking on it seven steps it finds alarming very you say the cucumber was higher one moment friend here interrupts the liar sooner than use the bridge i'll seek the nearest ferry chapter fifteen the pond and the river why is it to a river said a neighboring pond forgive me pray for prying you are of exercise so fond oh sister can it be you of fatigue are dying looking far i always see on you deep laden vessels come in view you patiently great rafts will carry i speak not of the countless little boats and barks or think of such and why do you yourself thus harry strain would have left on me its marks in truth my lot compared with yours is mild and pleasant of course i am not present upon a map 
you occupy a page complete no songs or mighty odes their praise of me repeat but that is scarce a matter vital to balance it i vaunt my soft and reedy banks as maids for gentleness give thanks to quiet rapture i've a title not only as to ships and pleasure trips have i in no respect to worry i cannot even guess the weight of any raft myself i need not flurry if on me falls a leaf that frail and tiny craft when a light gale upspringing toward me one shall waft could anything repay for loss of days so careless never by winds or breezes stirred i gaze on worldly vanities and trifles airless indulge in dreamy talk unheard you reason simply by this great law undeterred began in turn the river to water speed alone of freshness is the giver if i have now become a rushing wondrous stream it is in order that forsaking calm supreme i shall that edict follow moreover every year with copious water clear i am a blessing i win honors far from hollow and shall continue yet for ages long to run when you are already yes but slight existence showing shall be forgotten known by none her words prove true for up to now she's flowing while the poor pond year after year all wild deeply o'ercast with gloom and shadows darkest in misery the starkest grows stagnant and defiled art skill and talent surely from the world will vanish weakening every day if sloth exert its sway neglect and idleness must all successes banish chapter sixteen the merchant ivan come hither boy why have you disappeared be quick and give me joy here's news that will astonish if you but copy me i'll praise and not admonish a merchant summoned thus his nephew to attend you know the polish cloth that roll the end we've had a while in stock a secret i'll confide twas damp and rotten small in value growing old that more than doubtful piece as english goods i've sold tis true within an hour i've taken for it fifty and a fool's want supplied uncle indeed you have the nephew dryly cried some one has foolish been tis not to be denied but look that note is false your customer was thrifty so he was cheated that would cheat nor is it strange for view man's earthly range nothing unglanced at leaving you'll find that every one is crafty politic and somehow for his own advantage quick one will his neighbor slyly trick another's apt at bold deceiving chapter seventeen the nightingales when spring smiled down the vales a man beneath an oak entrapped some nightingales which being put in cages soon began to quaver poor things at liberty their efforts had been braver although a song in prison lacks the wanted ring what else shall we do here but sing thus ask the captives weary among them all a little wretched bird most feels the torment dreary for with his mate he can exchange no word it tastes of death so far from heaven's light oh i would know again the ecstasy of flight lamenting night and day he suddenly exclaims sorrow be gone away only a fool bewails misfortune the wise should fate importune by action cure their cruel wrongs twere well to carol forth some pretty songs what seeks this man to view our feathers glisten it may be to a few of my best notes he'd listen if only i by chance could please him with my voice tis like enough he'd soften bid me new rejoice who knows he might indeed from prison bars deliver so reasoning the bird begins to trill always at rosy eve becomes a joyous giver 
At sunrise his small form appears with bliss to quiver. What follows from his dainty skill? Far from deliverance he gets no tiny guerdon. Birds which sang feebly long ago were set at liberty and rescued from their woe, escaped captivity's dread burden. But for my sweetest songster, frail, that never seems to tire or fail, no tender effort can avail. Chapter 18 Demyon's Fish Soup I beg you, be so kind, just favor me and taste it. Neighbor, I pray you, do not press me. Change your mind, another spoonful, do not waste it. This fish soup is the thing, tis luscious capital. I've swallowed now three portions. What of that, no matter? Come now, no foolish chatter. Think of your health, and eat it all. This soup, indeed, with many a ball, As if fine amber beads had hither chanced to fall. Quick, eat it, O oh, my comrade dearest. Here's brim with giblets nice. Here's sturgeon, where it's clearest. Another little morsel. Wife, upon him call. Warm-hearted friend Demyon, thus urges Foka keenly, allows him never respite, smiles serenely. Sweat starts on Foka's face to gather as might rain. Nevertheless, he lets himself be helped again. Making an effort, though a drear one, finishes all. "'Ah, you're the sort I love,' remarks Demyan. "'You're not an appetite above another little plateful? Come, then, oh, my dear one!' But Foka, hot and red, though liking fish soup much had grown a prey to dread and fur cap grasping painfully gasping uprose without delay and fled and since to friend demyan no word has said author however blessed because true gifts possessing if you are prone to wander many times digressing and grow by prolix ways distressing know that your glorious prose or transcendental verse becomes a blight and is than too much fish soup worse chapter nineteen the cock and the pearl a cock that on a heap was scratching said when he found amongst rubbish a fine pearl what's this and with contemptuous twirl passed it as not worth snatching oh madly they behave who value baubles high i would less eagerly for such a plaything sigh than for a grain of wheat which calls for action hasty is tasty the ignorant have soon enough of what is past their kin pronounced it wretched stuff chapter twenty the cornflower a cornflower solitary grew throve but a sudden pining pitifully faded scarce raised its head less bright of hue shrank as by thoughts of death invaded then to the gentle zephyr whispered soft and low if only day itself would quickly show if but once more the sun should deign to prove his glory i might perhaps revive to tell a grateful story you strange and simple soul nearby a beetle grumbled from a hole Think you the mighty sun has any thought concerning your humble look and health and growth? Cares if to blossom you are loath? Believe me that he lacks both time and taste for learning things vain as this. If only you by flight attained a higher bliss, you'd see that here the meadows, fields, and tillage are as close bound to him as unto gods a village for radiant ever by his heat he helps the poplars oaks and cedars yews and beeches so blossoms wondrous forms and colors sweet reveal a puissance that to exquisiteness reaches know even that he dowers matchless and gorgeous flowers with undreamed witcheries their traits and powers are such that time with scythe regretful strikes them unblessed with fragrance small of size you should not dare attract the sun's majestic eyes. On forms like yours he never looks, perhaps dislikes them. Cease to aspire forthwith, control thy vapid will, whither be still. But the sun rose and shone, and nature new delighted. Throughout the land of plants distributed his beams, 
and the poor flower that wilted in the hour of dreams with gratitude the boon requited o oh, you to whom fate gives with pride of race a lofty place my son before you his example now advances cast glances unto whatever spot his light can reach he's there to give to cedar eye and grass in equal share a radiance uncompelled a happiness caressing as in an eastern crystal a spark burns so in the heart of each that sunward turns are left an image and a blessing End of chapters 11 to 20 Chapters 21 to 30 Of Krylov's Fables by Ivan Andreevich Krylov Selected and translated by C. Fillingham Coxwell, M.D. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter 21 The Fly and the Bee in spring along a waving stalk a fly ascending seas set high above her on a flower a bee ensconced as in a bower and haughtily remarks a busy state is yours that all the day from morn to eve dull work endures call to vexatious toil i might indeed have fainted leading toward labor coy in paradise a life of joy i am with such a care acquainted as flying amongst the guests at balls where gracefully i publish how my sole connections are in the town's superior sections but you should know what glorious feasting to me falls at any rout or birthday party whither i surely come the first and eat off dainty porcelain next i quench my thirst sipping choice wines from crystal so that I feel hearty before the other guests. I sate my needs, with me to try the sweets it rests. I force my way where a maid is, among the youthful beauties mix. Yes, moments of inaction fix on rosy cheek or snowy neck among the ladies. All this I know full well, replies the modest bee. But then there have reached me ugly rumors. You are from folks' affections free even at weddings plague with selfish humors and so if e'er they find you scheming in a home they drive you forth to roam no matter says the fly they cannot my sort smother being through one door chased i enter by another chapter twenty two the quartet an ape an ass a goat and bruin in sport resort to actions they are new in together scheme to play quartet they filch the score a cello bass two fiddles then sitting neath a lime to solve sounds riddles and wide enchant their brains they set using the bow with force outrageous measures get now brothers stay the ape implores a moment linger tis melody we seek and lifts a warning finger here, Bruin, opposite the tenor, bring your base. I'll, as first scraper, sit before the second. Our efforts so will come with better grace. On woods and hills applause, I've reckoned. They moved, and the quartet began, but scarcely favorably ran. A minute, please, I found a plan, brays out the ass. Twere more for us befitting in a line sitting obeying they resumed with order in a row but tuneful strains harmonious did not flow came quarrels and disunion then as ever but never agreed they where to stay a nightingale flew nigh who hearkening in dismay was forthwith asked by them to settle their contention have patience with us listen and allay dissension how to ensure success please indicate each of us has a book an instrument elate to find our seats we wait for the musician's art are needed comprehension skill taste and hearing sensitive my candid words forgive places however you may change them you'll shock your friends nay more estrange them chapter twenty three the ducat of worth is education of value vast beyond a doubt, 
but if we show ourselves devout in finer lore we bring cessation of sturdy forces needful for salvation to are prudent therefore to examine close lest we of culture give an o'er-compelling dose ne'er should enlightenment too much the mind engross we must not weaken spirit undermine our manners annihilate the simple life nor having made the trivial rife should we enroll our folk beneath inglorious banners aroused by such a cause for strife one well could pen a book or make important speeches but not to every one this urgency yet reaches so writing as in play insisting not o'er much i'll hint what i would say a simple soul this story of such teaches when walking home upon the ground amid the dust and dirt a ducat found the news being known were offered to the peasant three handfuls of bright coppers in exchange he pauses waits a while requests a larger present coveting wealth both new and pleasant imagines craftily he better can arrange sharp gravel sand and chalk obtaining and even pounding up a brick he thinks a fortune he is gaining impatient strives and quick proceeds the ducat's sides and edges to brighten scratches and tears then diligent repairs while in a word his treasure's brilliancy would heighten the grimy ducat thus was purified and glossed but not as heavy after his levy the piece of gold had thinned and half its value lost chapter twenty four the eagle and the spider an eagle that o'er clouds his way through caucasus was threading perched on a cedar far from crowds gazed down on varied wonders spreading at once he seemed to view the kingdoms of the earth great fertile plains that knew of winding streams no dearth here grooves and meadows rich gave birth to verdure bright and scenes engaging and there the mighty caspian raging so dark was that compared it dulled the raven's worth i praise thee zeus that thou when great events ordaining decided so to establish me in vastness reigning that here i lightly move monarch of the world he ceased a small voice him saluted as well my eyes perceive the beauties here unfurled i have in flight your sway disputed you are a boaster rare to me it seems that i a spider have your claims refuted lower i am than you o comrade in my dreams the eagle looked a spider had done much from a near branch around him a web spun on a small twig was stirring already of the sky the eagle's view was blurring how camest thou to this glorious height thus asked the eagle fright ere long possesses all that are in flying boldest precludes the vantage that thou holdest wingless a weakling really didst thou upward crawl nay i should never have so decided then who thee safely hither guided i to yourself my life confided e'en from below i grasped your tail and did not fall but i can here continue quite at ease without you and though it does not enter my designs to flout you i know that i a gust from where's no consequence to an abyss blew down the spider thence how think you sirs in truth i do not tremble saying that such as give nor thought nor toil but to grow rich and round a great man coil in certain traits the spider close resemble they puff out well the chest and look as if endowed with a surpassing vigor it only needs the wind's unrest and lo they cut a wretched figure chapter twenty five the peasant and the robber a peasant setting up a home bought at a fair a milk pail and cow together and then in pleasant weather journeying through the forest to his home would roam but sudden he a robber came on who left him bare as any lime tree stripped of bark have pity cried the peasant to my pleadings hark show of compassion just a spark 
for more than a whole year i've centered my every aim on this handsome cow the wish has filled my soul tis well you shall my deeds control thus spoke the thief ne'er mercy stifle i do not lack a pail with which to milk your cow so will allow that you shall have the wished-for trifle chapter twenty six the lion and the panther a lion in past days chanced on an agile panther and in frequent frays the ownership of sundry woods and dens disputed actions at law with beasts are not the usual mode animals strong and fierce being so constituted that they observe a simple code always the weaker bear the load however in order not eternally to bicker letting their wrath out flicker they thought than strife a legal settlement were quicker into their minds it came to cease their conflicts rude and with the brawl suspension to offer terms eternal peace conclude till the next tension let us appoint for each a secretary glib of speech suggests the panther to the lion his fine metal our feud will settle with such a purpose sound i will engage a cat a creature no way puissant save to kill a rat do you appoint an ass who is a being noted and by the by excuse the thought he'll surely prove to you enormously devoted believe me as a friend your counsel are as naught in sapience grave beside his muzzle we can rest certain that my cat and he will solve the hardest puzzle the lion soon in all concurred as splendid but liking not the ass a fox to him preferred in this particular the scheme amended remarking to himself showing he something new tis well your enemy's suggestions to eschew chapter twenty seven the wolf in the kennel at night a wolf with thoughts on sheep folds centered a kennel entered and swift aroused the angry pack that scenting near at hand the gray and horrid bully barked against each other struggled felt the insult fully the huntsman crying lads were on his track prepared to meet the strange attack forthwith the kennel scene grows hellish men up with cudgels run or load a gun a light there bring a light tis quickly done the wolf retreats the prospect does not relish but grinds his teeth and sits with bristling hair pressed in a corner while his eyes with fury glare perceiving that no lambs the scene embellish and that he has indeed at last to settle for his thieving past he opens all aghast negotiations thus craftily begins my friend why raise this din i'm of your kith and kin peace is my wish to-day i love not altercations let us forget the past and i'll observe this rule not only toward your flocks will my ardor cool but for their benefit i other wolves shall school an oath as wolf i promise and am willing always o oh neighbor patient list but says the huntsman with raised fist fellow i'm grayer than you wist in wolfish matters i a serious part am filling and therefore tis my custom a in no respect with strolling wolves to play except to take their skins away and instantly his dogs the visitor are killing chapter twenty eight apelles and the young ass apelles the great artist saw an ass colt asked him on a visit am i an honored guest why is it the ass demanded nigh some beast would draw and say apelles often in a hurry myself will worry i plague and torture me to serve some flattering end I'm sure he likes my look, dear friend, and sketches me as Pegasus the noted. Oh, no, Apelles said, who happened to stand near. 
I wish to find a model long of ear, for Midas, whom the gods to be an ass promoted, favor me with a call, I shall be very glad, though I have countless donkeys' ears at times inspected, I ne'er even among the old and sad, and full-grown, good or bad, discerned ears as large as yours, therefore are you selected. CHAPTER Twenty Nine, THE MISER A goblin of the house, guarding a golden store, was by the demon chief called from beneath the floor, and sent in far-off lands to wander. Exiled for many years, on other cares to ponder, in service strict the goblin could not well ignore this secret authoritative bidding. But how was it to keep, despite the ridding, the treasure safe, preserved from all attack, until it should come back? To hire a proper guardian, or construct defences, would institute o'er great expenses. To leave the chests alone would bring the risk of loss, that could not for a day be thought of, since thieves who came the place across would hindrances make naught of. The spirit worried, brooded, satisfied at last, into the presence of the skinflint owner passed. Yet first of all it dug out of the ground the treasure. It says, O oh, master, please some news to hear. I have to travel far, such is my ruler's pleasure, but you will be a recollection dear. Now at farewell, as friendship's token, I have brought out this gorgeous array. Eat, drink, be ever gay, squander in course unbroken. If it shall come to you to die, then who should your heir be but I? That is my sole condition. Meantime, may destiny promote your chief ambition. It spoke, was gone. The goblin, after years a score, sudden from distant toil forbore, returned once more, through hidden regions sailing. What sees it? Oh, the joy! Behold the miser pressed, of hunger dead upon his treasure chest nor riches there are failing the guardian takes again the gold no ducats losing gloats that since days of old expenses have been naught though plans of its own choosing if any wealthy miser lives but as a mouse who will receive his hoard the goblin of the house chapter thirty the sightseer Good day, my best of friends. Tell me, where have you strayed? Oh, to the big museum, really, I'm afraid. I've walked at least three hours. Can you conceive it? My mind's so full, by talking I'll relieve it. I have amazing sights surveyed, a place remarkable, that hall of wonders. There nature, her extent and potency, forth thunders, what beasts and birds have I astounded there not seen? What butterflies and beetles spiny, and various flies, cockchaffers shiny, in hue some coral-like and some of emerald green? There scarcely than a pin-head greater were ladybirds and curious works of the Creator. You saw the elephant? Describe his form and say, is he a mountain, past all question? He is not there. Oh, yes. Then I mistook the way. Of such a thing got no suggestion. End of chapters 21 to 30。Chapters 31 to 40 of Krilov's Fables by Ivan Andreevich Krilov, selected and translated by C. Fillingham Coxwell, M.D. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Kevin Davidson. Chapter 31 The Mirror and the Monkey. A monkey, having viewed her portrait in a glass, turned to a bear by whom she wished to pass, touching him lightly, said, What hideous ass can that be, my dear fellow? Always a fresh contortion, skip, grimace, and stare. I'd hang myself if I should wear that look ridiculous, become but half as yellow. I will, however, this confess, 
among my friends perhaps a dozen more or less as awkward are and faces similar possess what needs acquaintances to reckon when you within the mirror writhe and beckon thus bruin sharply cried the ape with angry look heard only to deride of such examples there are many satire detraction truth of these we love not any i saw it even yesterday peter is not quite honest there are curious stories tis said in taking bribes he glories and yet he looks at paul in a peculiar way chapter thirty two the tree seeing a peasant passing with an axe a sapling said to him my kind and friendly fellow direct against the trees around me fierce attacks they thwart my wish to spread and mellow scant light its way can hither thread my roots are cramped secure no chance to spread at liberty about me play no breezes or head a great mass intertwines goes where it pleases if only every hindrance to my growth were less i should within a year a beauty rare possess bestow a gracious shade on all the valley while now from wretchedness my spirits cannot rally the peasant quickly got to work was easily persuaded and well the grumbler aided took care that near the tree no living thing should lurk alas the triumph did not continue by the sun's rays the tree was baked hail ruthless struck it till it ached a fearful tempest broke its inner fibrous sinew thereon a serpent spoke thou surely has been mad brought on thyself this trouble sad well sheltered in the forest would have shout up bravely nor sultriness nor hurricane could thee have hurt the older trees were present evil to avert then if at a later date inscrutably and gravely destiny thought to strike them down all at the proper time thou mightst have earned a crown as an example rare of vigour living to boast of strife wherein thou wealth's did figure overcoming many storms have won a sure renown chapter thirty three the brook a shepherd once approached a brook in piteous grief complaining sorely that a cruel swollen river had filched his lamb a pretty giver of simple comfort joy too brief the brook first heard then said with exclamation bitter o oh, stream insatiable if only thy broad bed even as mine were wed to clearness pure and honest glitter if only folk thy victims but in chief could view who despite mud were easily revealed in thy position i ashamed my strength would yield had into corners shrunk and my deep shame concealed if waters poured my channels through swiftly as now they leave thy pasture spreading and they thy lovely banks are threading i would have done no creature harm nor cause through noxious floods man's terrible alarm would have set angrily no bush nor flower in motion but earning gratitude from every neighboring farm had left the prosperous fields to breathe a peaceful calm for order would have shown devotion i in a word while doing good upon my way would nowhere have produced the least disaster nay smiling if through rains my bulk grew vaster i would have seaward gone benign and pure and gay so truly thought the brook and spoke as to a brother a peaceful week arrived another then near at hand a rain-cloud burst upon a hill in torrents the brook with watery wealth could nigh a river fill and showing rage held lately in abhorrence has quickly forced its banks to know its muddy will it boils and roars and hurries foam in frothy masses breaks trees all boundaries passes deafens with noise that's heard afar thus the same shepherd sad for whom it wordy war reproachfully had preached arrived at desolation with his whole flock met devastation his home 
and all that was there forever were o'erthrown. How many brooks develop only kindness, to evil lures exhibit blindness, because they force and volume never yet have known. Chapter 34 The Kite a paper kite that soared on high while looking down was able to decry a joyous butterfly, and cried, We faintly see your foolish efforts zealous, confess that you are rather jealous, when you behold our elevated lot. Jealous? Oh, surely not. Your grandeur is a phantom, or an empty vision. Your tethered flight awakens, believe me, but derision. Can happiness be got from an existence ever fettered? And how could life for me be bettered? As I aspire, I venture higher, and never solely for another's idle leisure and pleasure lose freedom I desire. Chapter 35 The Impious Of old among the peoples dwelt a race in shame, who sinning specially their wicked hearts enlisted, fiercely against the gods with arms resisted, a thousand banners hurried, crowds of rebels came, carrying bows or slings, and vilely heaven flouted the leaders of the throng, audacious, keen of mind, to rouse their folk to fury, words disgraceful shouted. Said the court of Zeus, severe is a and blind, slumber perchance the gods, but doing justice rarely, they now require a lesson of a kind. So from the neighboring hills, men scheming not unfairly, should hurl against the great a strength combined of arrows in Olympus' mother. Dreading such portent strange, God spoke with one another. At a conference this prayer to Zeus preferred, do thou restrain this monstrous herd of creatures insolent forthwith to action stirred convince the anarchists rudely by peals of thunder or marvel make them wonder or by an inundation vast or an o'erwhelming shower of stones upon them cast at last said zeus if longer they remain unquiet stiff-necked persist of the immortals show not fear their deeds well whelm them, tis my fiat. Then clouds as dark as night appear, huge stones and arrows sharp from the insurgents flying, caused ghastly wounds of countless deaths, and tell the dying, that their own missiles swift have fallen on their heads. Doubt as an agile foreman treads, its punishment sure spreads, the scoffs of evil prophets are but falsest notions, inciting, spurring against a goodness wise and true, the hour of death will, reaching even you, as a deep piercing arrow, summon dread emotions. CHAPTER Thirty Six, THE MOUSE AND THE RAT O oh, neighbor, hast thou heard the news, of course? Up to a rat a mouse came running. Our cat has felt in conflict all the lion's force. We'll move at ease, no more her presence shunning. Rejoice not yet, my dear. True wisdom from a rat now here. Away with strange beliefs unfounded. If claws can interfere, the lion soon will be astounded. A cat in strength has no compeer. Chapter 37 Two peasants. Good morning, Thaddeus. Good morning, friend Igor. How goes it with you? Well, I trust you're cheerful. Our friend, you have not heard of my adventure fearful. I burnt my home, possessing one no more. Too sadly, I advance from door to door. Because? Some accident regretful? Well, at a Christmas party, I became forgetful, and with a candle went to give the horse a feed, I own, just then. My head was humming, somehow I dropped the light, and no way could succeed sudden flames in overcoming. And you? Oh, Thaddeus, an accident benumbing, an angered God will retribution plan. You see, a legless man, that I remain alive, is nothing but a wonder. I, too, at Christmas, sought some beer, the dwelling under. Besides, must own, already had drunk wine with friends, demanding pleasure, and feeling queer, I thought it 
a wise measure myself to darkness to confine the devil pushed and i rolled down the steep incline alas as punishment for loving too much tipple i go about a hopeless cripple but blame yourselves my friends said to them father stephen he's wise who comprehends there's nothing to astonish in that you fired your house or you limp lame and slow but mostly i such folk admonish as drinking much in darkness choose to go chapter thirty eight the lion and the fox the fox had ne'er a lion seen and meeting one she trembled abject grew of mien a little later she a second lion chanced on and now a figure far less frightened glanced on when latter came the third she was to conversation with the lion stirred chapter thirty nine the peasant and the snake a snake aspired to live within a peasant's house avoiding an existence idle would feed the children nurse them and their tempers bridle not to emulate some lazy mouse i know too well she says there's an ancient notion widely among good people rife that only strife and every form of wild commotion follow our entry to the home you dare affirm that snakes are never grateful that with a horrid purpose serpents roam more their behavior e'en to their own young is hateful if there be wicked snakes i am not one of such ne'er in an honest life have i a victim bitten my fangs shall ne'er a creature touch pining for genial deeds i'm willing to do much embrace the kitten caress a maid love smitten despite her heartache a snake would now the proper care of infants undertake even if your words the peasant answers be not truthless i would not greet a shape so ruthless if i should weakly show any such liking another snake would come we next her kin should know ah woe a hundred fangs would be my children striking therefore i deem o kind and gentle friend because alas good snakes i can't get used to a present wrong i'll mend forthwith the peasant not reduced to egregious folly of the serpent made an end chapter forty the barrel for only three short days i ask of you my friend grant me a special boon namely a barrel lend now service is to comrades holy tis different when the matter's one of money solely then love is less in question and one can refuse why should not friends your barrel use but soon it has returned arrived the pleasing news and once again is water holding alas no longer it is with the thing all well falling beneath a curse or weird and curious spell it lately has acquired a strangely venous smell a redolence that's faded of the jaunt to tell if it be filled with kvass or beer is told their knell the owner a whole year sly schemes unfolding now scalded and now dried it in the wind oh many methods shrewd designed could yet the subtle vapour find and so at last exchange the barrel for another try fathers to remember this my fable brief company doubtful causes grief is bad for sister as for brother examples of ill deeds and words are apt to stay far better keep a harm away than after consequences smother end of chapters thirty one to forty chapters forty one to fifty of krylov's fables by ivan andreevich krylov selected and translated by c fillingham coxwell m d this librivox recording is in the public domain recording by kevin davidson chapter forty one the fox a fox ere night had changed to morning drank at an ice hole in a time of cruel frost but since he carelessly was due attention scorning the bushy tail which formed his chief and proud adorning became with freedom lost 
to the ice fixed. The fox might well have prevented, with little force had cured his grief. Destroying a few hairs, he would have grown contented and snatched, in brief, a true and wise relief. Alas, he could not act, nothing would him embolden to maim a tale so soft and golden. Was it not well to wait? Neighbors were sleeping fast, and it appeared to him the ice would scarcely last. T'would melt, and soon his tail surrender. He stayed, and while the chance of liberty grew slender, up rose the sun with splendor, then peasants early moved, whose voices loud were heard. So the poor fox, by terror stirred, confused, sprang vainly hither, or but to loose himself as desperately thither luckily came a wolf dear kind good honest friend the fox implored oh save me from a hideous end the wolf his way arrests the difficulty sagely breasts with action that could scarcely fail gnaws off the sure imprisoned tail whereat the luckless victim gratitude pretended bereft of all his pride his homeward journey winded chapter forty two the sheep and the dogs in order that a flock of sheep despite ferocious wolves may well and safely slumber the farmer's dogs are multiplied in number what then so great a pack he wills to keep that though the flock in truth will ne'er through wolves diminish the guardians fall in straits for food, have soon their teeth in blood imbrued, though snatching off to you, become both wild and thinnish, next in a lonely field with many a victim strewed, the dogs the last one finish. CHAPTER Forty Three: THE GEESE Armed with his stick, a peasant was driving geese to market in the town, but sad to say the rustic clown persuaded oft the flock in manner far from pleasant. His mind being turned to profit on a lofty scale, and sometimes in financial matters greed to the wind's consideration scatters. Yet would I not this man assail, although the geese regarding him with angry passion and having met by chance a passer-by forth hissed their thought in candid fashion were geese unhappier e'er seen by any eye this fellow leaves us never quiet conveys to us as unto common things his fiat churlishly thinks that little is our due but he should show himself respectful lost had been rome if once our race had proved untrue our ancestors in face of risk were not neglected their cackling warned the centuries who the foe repelled be pleased to add in what you have excelled demands the passer-by our ancestors that meagre story is yet reported but to know i'm eager if you yourselves have well behaved our ancestors the city saved no doubt but what have you yourselves effected we nothing yet then nothing yet to you is owed your ancestors were properly respected rome due devotion to them showed but you will roast however well connected chapter forty four the peasants and the river peasants who cursed in consternation the devastation wrought by the rivulets and streams at the spring flooding not half-hearted but keen for satisfaction nursing pleasant dreams unto the river that received such brooks departed o oh, to denounce them there was cause for here the crops were scattered too the mills were washed away such mattered counting drowned beasts one could not pause yet peacefully the river flowed and hastened proudly how on its banks men women sped and nothing said against it air of evil loudly it sighs the peasants touches wears away their anger undermines their reason when they have nearer come they gaze at that sad season and surely know the river's treason shamefully half their goods away it bears 
yet never troubling it with their affairs, the simple peasants watched its course with silent glances, then at each other gave a look, their heads slow shook, and the road took, homewards they deemed, mid life's mischances, to struggle against oppressors is but useless toil, if base superiors are sharers in the spoil. CHAPTER Forty Five, THE WOLF AND THE CAT Out of the forest ran a wolf in fear, made for a village, seeking shelter, began to think his end was near, as the pursuing pack deep bayed in deafening welter, to gain a refuge sure he looked for unlatched gates, and faced disaster, for bolts were more than he could master. Seeing a cat, instead of going faster, he waits. O oh, puss! Upon the fence, he calls, say whom thou findest of all the peasants here the kindest, who will protect me from the anger of my foes. Thou hearest the loud barking, ah, the din yet grows, they're coming after me. Better to Stephen hurry, he is a first-rate fellow, ill at ease, Tom cries. I took a sheep. I love all woolly things and furry. Suppose you dared Demian to worry? I think he gazed at me with wicked eyes. I ate his lambkin, white and gentle. Tromfeyum lives there. Be off and quick. Not to Tromfeyum. He'd meet me with a gun or stick. In spring I killed his kid. Twas almost accidental. Indeed. Well, try to get assistance from old Flick. He lost a calf. My friend, your past is detrimental. You have the village folk beyond a doubt annoyed. And the cat added dryly, by what defence is now your quaking soul upboid? Our simple countrymen, though sometimes far from wily, will not be softened by your woeful, anxious plight. That you accuse yourself is right. Your day is past. Now comes the night. Chapter forty six The Hermit and the Bear. E'en if in troubled hours we much to kindness owe, not every one will soar to friendship's duties exactly gauge and weigh its beauties an orificious fool can harm us like a foe a certain man once dwelt kindred without and lonely in a far waste and wilderness now though you greatly may a desert sojourn bless seclusion may be painful if it be yours only tis comforting for folks their joys and griefs to share yes but the meadows wild the forests gloom impressive the little streams and hills, new tents and form successive. Now surely such as these are fair. Nay, all is dull without some intercourse expressive. The hermit, then, being bored, his isolated irksome days abhorred, would pierce the thickets dense and jostle gainst a neighbor. Someone's acquaintance early make, yet save a wolf or a snake, whom should he join with all his labor? In simple truth, ere long, he faces a great bear, and bowing low, without a second losing, surveys the fellow with a genial stare. As were the meeting one of his own choosing, the bear extends his paw, and both with interchange of words grow kindly, are drawn to one another blindly, for further mutual happiness arrange. But as to how they shaped their private conversation, with tales, embellishment, or sundry jests, springing from humorous behests, concerning that I'm quite unknowing. The man is hardly talkative. The bear, without a word, can live, is pleased when useful qualities he's showing, and yet, whate'er may hap, the hermit's wondrous glad, a pleasant fellowship he has had. He dwells with Bruin much, else falls to prey a sickness, follows on short excursions with sufficient quickness. Once when the heat had stilled each bird, unto our friends to roam in woodlands it occurred, by love of hills and valleys stirred, now than a shaggy bear's the human's frame is weaker. The hermit grew for rest a seeker much sooner than his friend. In vain he tried his pace to mend, observing which the bear pronounced a word judicious, Lie down, little brother, rest. Among the pine trees will be best, and I will guard thee from all enemies malicious. The hermit laid him down and gave a yawn, had soon from earth withdrawn, 
but Bruin stayed on watch, and fanned with motion active the features to a fly attractive about the nose it played. There stayed, or sought the cheek, until he drove it off to settle again upon the nose. It ere such spots unfortunately chose, at last the bear, to show his honest metal, up in his paws a weighty cobble caught, then slowly crouching down and silent forward bending, remarked, "'You nuisance, I to you must be attending. Tis time for me this insect further to be sending.' and using all his strength the fly a lesson taught after the mighty blow his skull being sadly shattered the hermit did not move and nothing to him mattered chapter forty seven the eagle and the fowls once on a glorious day to fill his soul with wonders an eagle proudly soaring high flew swiftly by the realms whence issue thunders Quitting at last the clouds, he, not unmoved by scorn, alighted haply on a kiln for drying corn. Tis true the humble perch was all for him unsuited, the eagle yet might have a special taste, or it is possible there he himself low placed, because at hand was nothing grand, severe, or chaste, no rock or oaken bough quite undisputed. I scarcely guess his reason, merely certain no. It is not long, ere lo, he to a second kiln elects to go. Observing this, forthwith a hen, small-crested, is drawn her gossip dear to ask, Why does this bird in honor bask, not for his powers of flight, as now by us attested? Really, I only have to try, in order, with success, from kiln to kiln to fly, how come it that we humbler birds are driven to rank proud eagles far ourselves above? They fly as low as we do, and perch as we do, love. And e'en might know a simple dove. They've no more eyes or legs than unto us are given. The kingbird answers soon, by such dull words annoyed. Your truth with folly is alloyed. Eagles may chance to fly as low as barn-door chickens, but ne'er a hen her way amidst the azure quickens. If you shall genius have to judge, search for its weaknesses, you will not labor vainly. Note, too, its excellencies, and discuss them sanely. Despise not merit, nor to understand it grudge. Chapter 48 The Aged Lion a lion, once the forest king, when growing old and nigh bereft of vigor, could not himself on foes with proper fury fling. Grieving could no respect from other creatures ring, nor onward in his weakness drag his splendid figure, but chiefly he was pained that the inferior beasts his presence much disdained. By every means avenge the monarch's previous slighting, seemed happy when his ancient overlordship, spiting at times the stallion with its hoofs to strike him, dares, whom next the wolf sharp tears, or the horned bull his wrath declares. The wretched ruler, all things soon deploring, with a scarce beating heart, awaits a fatal end and only strives his woes to mend with weary, feeble roaring. At length he spies a donkey that he surely feels would strike him with its heels if it could only find a spot exposed and tender. O oh, gods! the groaning lion now exclaims, Alas! has my condition reached this horrid pass to the last stroke of fate? I'll eagerly surrender, Death's shock were not so crass that my soul should suffer insult from an ass. Chapter 49 The Man with Three Wives A man of horrid notions, while yet his wife was living, dared to marry twice. It happened that the Tsar, severe, precise, was not inclined to wink at free emotions, and roused by such a strange misdeed, he to the judges spoke without delay, decreed that for the culprit they a punishment should hit on. 
which would deter the crowd from matching such a crime, or mentioning aloud the tale as one to try its wit on. And if I think the penalty inflicted light, I'll hang around the court the judges from a height. The joke appears unpleasant, and the unhappy lawyers sweat again, nor leave the court three days are present, in order to devise a just and proper pain of torments there are thousands, but experience teaches rarely a penalty to cure wrongdoing reaches. However, in due time God made the judges sage. The vile offender summoned back was given, to know the court had striven, and felt unanimously driven, to say that he with all three wives at once must swage. New misery, thereon the people frightened, deemed at the angry Tsar would stretch the judges' necks. Four days of strife, the man so vex that round his throat a cord he tightens which dismal fate has woke the citizens to dread. No one cares three wives at once to wed. A life monotonous thus lightens. CHAPTER Fifty, THE CLOUD Quick o'er a countryside, a thirst for copious showers, a gloomy rain-cloud, selfish past, disdained to shed relief, exerted not its powers, yet coming to the sea, Disgorged a torrent vast. Vaunting it calls to witness how it nature dowers. What service have you done to man and crops or flowers? Thus having rude begun, the hills remarked with deep emotion, If only the parched fields from thee a gift had won, Thou wouldst have famine stayed, despite a scorching sun. Oh, it was wickedness to waste thy store on ocean. End of chapters 41 to 50. Recording by Kevin Davidson. www.blogordie.com Chapters 51 through 60 of Krylov's Fables by Ivan Andreevich Krylov. Selected and translated by C. Fillingham Coxwell, M.D. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Kevin Davidson. Chapter 51. The Sportsman. A sportsman seized his bag and cartridges and gun, whistled to Jolly Rover, trusty friend, light-hearted, and to the woods for birds departed, but loaded not his piece, as if the game were won, novel was such a strange omission tis well says he relief from toil is my ambition the birds are never near twill turn out later right the coveys slowly come in sight and then i'll get to work and load with all my might scarce had he left his dwelling when sudden a fate at jest against him might be telling along the lake some ducks flew up both swift and steady the sportsman easily could take two pair or half a dozen were he ready to kill for many days have food at will alas our reckless one not yet can try his skill though he loads quickly no for now the birds were showing themselves too knowing so when he was at last prepared they loudly whirred by fear excited and flew beyond the copse by the same hope united a wish for safety shared in vain the marksman paced the woods in many a section never a little sparrow went in his direction but trouble fresh was piled on care foul weather ne'er abated his weary spirits flag he can his limbs an empty bag scarce homeward drag blaming vile fortune cries the journey was ill-fated chapter fifty two the lion the chamois and the fox a lion who a chamois followed and now had nigh his quarry caught indulged in many a luscious thought enjoyed the morsels to be swallowed while nothing came hunter and prey between blocking the further path appeared a large ravine but lo the chamois lightly gathering her forces sprang like an arrow from a bow flew high above deep water courses and from the other side surveyed her foe below 
the lion stops in wonder regards in awe the spot where cliffs are rent asunder approaches then a fox and says o monarch agile fleet thou never yieldest thou greater vigour than a chamois wieldest tis surely possible to clear these little rocks the gulf is somewhat wide still from a hunter eager twill need but effort meagre rely upon thy friend's discretion and be wise i would not such a peril to thee now advise nor myself trouble but for thy skill in every enterprise the lion's blood begins to seethe and bubble he hurls himself with all his sinewy might but failing to reach quite the object of his flight head foremost falls disaster meets past mending and what about his comrade true he slyly in the narrow cleft descending forthwith the uselessness of further fawning knew and wrought his pleasure in comfort ease and at his leisure said for the dead a prayer alone and nibbled in a week the lion to the bone chapter fifty three the workman and the peasant a workman and a peasant old at eve slow homeward strolled but sudden where the wood was thickest were prompted to the question who should scape the quickest scarce had the peasant breathed before a bear its claws unsheathed and trod him under turned him over then selected whither attentions finally should be directed clearly the old man's hour arrives o oh, dearest stephen hasten strike with vigour he calls as neath the beast to free himself he strives our modern hercules cutting a splendid figure and using mighty force cleaves the bear's skull in twain shows new resource thrusting in bruin's paunch a pitchfork with all rigour loud roared the bear and soon in pangs extreme from earthly life departed whereon the peasant rose to scream words that appeared the hardest hearted astounded stephen stares aghast what's wrong he says what's wrong only your folly vast you ask me while i feel displeasure the fur is spoilt through your mad measure chapter fifty four fortune and the beggar holding a threadbare sack a beggar loitering where signs of wealth abounded bewailed of all good things his lack reflecting grew confounded that who in opulence and luxury and ease inhabits choice apartments is yet hard to please however much his pockets may be bursting for more he is thirsting covets to such an extent that in his crazy hunger he may like any money-monger lose all and so to loud lament give vent how long with what surpassing strokes of fortune here an old merchant plied his trade despite his riches vast no one could him persuade to take his leave of toil and making less parade no more for gold a fickle fate importun or ocean's surface yet he sent his ships to rome lusting for gain oft hostages to nature offered till last the treasures for the sea's destruction proffered found in the deep their home and his prodigious store remained beneath the foam another here a speculator a million roubles quickly won alas attempts to double them were never done till losing all he grew on chance a luckless waiter thousands of such examples rush into the mind men wilfully are blind here strangely came dame fortune and herself presented thus to the beggar said listen to help you i should more than be contented these ducats shall be well augmented your sack beneath now spread but i will pour them forth only on one condition though golden are the coins that you from here will haul if e'er from out the bag a single one shall fall ended is your ambition but ne'er a chance forget 
that clearly I forewarn how strictly you must keep the terms of this arrangement. The sack is very old. Ensure not my estrangement by letting it through greed be torn. The beggar now from joy is scarcely breathing, smiles his whole countenance are wreathing. He opens wide his bag, whither an unseen hand to pour a sum untold has generously planned. The sack's already weighing somewhat heavy. Is it enough? Not yet. Would it not crack? Oh, no. But look, Eucrosius, still I would a little levy. A trifle more, please throw. Be cautious how you act. The bag is strained below. Another tiny pinch. But now the sack is tearing. And all the wondrous heap has turned to common dust. Fortune has vanished. With the bag before him thrust, the beggar stares, then sighs, resumes his way, despairing. Chapter 55 The Hare at the Hunt Collecting in a mighty crowd the beasts a shaggy Bruin captured, and slew him, that they might, enraptured, distribute, as allowed, to each a proper portion. "'I'd like an ear,' a hare said, meaning no extortion. "'Squint-eyed, strange-browed,' they quickly cried. "'Thou darest ask an ear? "'None at the chase remarked that thou wast near,' replied she. "'Brothers, I'd no fear, but drove him from the forest, "'finished his career, and terrified him well. "'I am a puissant friend.' "'Such dreadful boasting, coupled with a claim excessive, "'amuses them, at once impressive, they to her paws a morsel of the ear extend. Chapter 56 The Mistress and Her Two Maids An aged dame, addicted much to grumbling, and ever her displeasures mumbling, had two young serving-maids, unhappy, pale, and thin, whose task from early morn till evening latest was tireless at the wheel to spin. Their course of life remains the straightest, no change arrives, comes no advance. To keep them breathless at the spindle is the old woman's rule. Her efforts never dwindle. She takes them from their slumber, with imperious glance, proceeds to make the spindle dance. Perhaps the mistress, harsh, her rule had once retarded, but that at hand was kept a certain cock, which crowed, until she sleep discarded, assumed a curious nightcap and a smock. Next in the stove a faggot lighted, and, threatening, made her way into the spinner's room, thence roughly hailed them to their day of painful gloom. Or used for stubbornness a broom, their weakness for repose successfully indicted, how vainly they demur to the command with frequent yawns receive it. Alas! Although the warm bed they prefer, they must with suddenness decide to leave it, always as soon as crows the soulless eager bird. The maidens by the scolder's phrases greeted are woke for treatment stern repeated. Would you were dead, was often heard, the spinners through their teeth thus angrily complaining. But for your noise we'd sleep a while in bed remaining. Take care. You'll some day come to harm. Then choosing a dark hour, and scorning pity, they twist its neck, cause no alarm, and next they that desired a situation pretty had brought about a scene reversed, from that rehearsed. Tis true poor Chanticleer had ceased to do his worst, as he no more was breathing, but dread of lateness in the mistress' mind was seething, she gave the maid small chance to shut their weary eyes before she came again the wretches to surprise for earlier than the cock had ere his clamour lifted the spinner's truth from error sifted they from a hardship slight to evils vast had drifted chapter fifty seven trishka's coat our trishka's coat has near the elbows given should be forthwith repaired. When for a needle he has striven, he slices off a quarter from the sleeves, and binding well the ends, a victory achieves. 
His naked arms are scarce a cause for gladness, and yet he feels no sadness when others, laughing, asks if he is cool. The little fellow says, I am not quite a fool, and will repair my blunder. That sudden act of mine makes people wonder. Oh, Trishka was indeed a sage. Coat-tail and lappets he divided, and having done his best an evil to assuage, wore with bliss of early age a novel garment oft derided. I've noticed that in this great land some country squires, indulging their desires, are apt, in Trishka's mood, to argue drolly, directing their affairs, for present reasons, wholly. CHAPTER 58 THE ANT A certain ant displayed a vigor strange and lusty. Seldom his curious species to such force attains. For instance, on the word of a historian trusty, he could from off the ground upraise two barley grains. Moreover, his great courage caused underlying wonder, for if on walks he chanced to meet a worm, he'd tear its shape asunder. Unaided, he could hold a spider firm. Moved by such recent truths, not legends hoary, within the ant hill where he dwelt, with but his valiant deeds the conversation dealt. As for the hero bold of this surprising story, homage from others was his life's especial glory, amused him well, afforded due nutrition for his ambition, when neath the influence of travelling he fell. For town became his passion rooted, there his vast merits should be bruited on to a load of hay betimes, he safe besides the driver climbs, and makes a journey long and splendid, though soon his pride receives a fatal blow. He thinks the whole bazaar will haste to see the show. Alas, hey-ho! Scant notice is to him extended, for each is busy with his own affairs. Now the ant takes a leaf, its surface stretches, falls down, springs up again, a burden fetches. Folk pass him unawares. Fatigued at length with all such evolutions thrilling, vexed to the soul, he to the mastiff said, that on his master's hay he made a pleasant bed. Barbos, now to confess, be willing, that in this wretched spot both sight and sense are unbegot. No passer-by implies that he a guerdon owes me, an hour of toil has made me hot, better my daily lot. At least the far-off ant hill knows me, and grumbling thus, ashamed, he homeward went. So one of simple bent and lonely fancies his wit the world confounds, but it astounds his little circle only. Chapter 59 The Cuckoo and the Eagle A cuckoo from the eagle won a prouder style. Now dubbed a nightingale, it did of an aspen shade avail it, with valiant effort would beguile the other feathered singers forthwith all fly away. Some mock aloud, and some with scornful notes inveigh. Angry, the cuckoo briefly lingers, then to the eagle with an urgent message hastes. I pardon ask, it ventures, but by your direction was I not raised to form the other's tastes, and now they dare to laugh at my perfection. My friend, the eagle said, I wield no magic rod, and cannot shield you from your present dire misfortune. That they should call you nightingale I could importune, but as to changing you, though king, I am not God. CHAPTER Sixty, THE FALSE ACCUSATION Tis simple, if you wish a wicked deed to smother, to put the blame upon another men oft are prone to say but that he prompted us we had not acted or if in other ways attracted they will the fault on satan lay although he none has evilly distracted of a tendency behold an instance clear turning to eastern lore a brahmin's history here who while in word and aspect pious was not averse to doubtful deeds Brahmins may show a moral bias, a fact not unimportant for our story's needs. The Brotherhood, one reads, 
possessed a member young less holy than were his fellows good and lowly he erred in this he could resent that chance for license came in his direction slowly but he ne'er openly acknowledged discontent however the same brahmin not dejected upon a fast day grew affected strangely ambitious felt to have a private feast finding an egg he paused till midnight tarried and then from caution's need released his treasure to the candle carried oh steadily the egg above the light he turns and watching zealously in thought a morsel swallows while next a fear his chief may know as surely follows if of my sin he ever learns but no the tyrant i don't fear him soon i shall eat and take my fill suddenly he feels a chill the dread superior standing near him astounded by the crime fiercely demands an explanation the proof self-evident precludes prevarication o oh, father grant sublime forgiveness from your nature gracious thus prays the brahmin through his tears alas i must confess that spiteful and audacious the devil urged me with his horrid sneers an imp's voice grates behold a scandal how dare you shift responsibility to us to whom you've shown a plan both new and humorous never before it happened thus to cook an egg upon a candle end of chapters fifty one through sixty recording by kevin davidson www.blogordie.com Chapters sixty one to seventy of Krilov's Fables. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Kevin Davidson. Krilov's Fables by Ivan Andreevich Krilov. Selected and translated by C. Fillingham Coxwell, M.D. Chapter sixty one The Swimmer and the Sea. High tossed by seething waves upon a lonely shore, a swimmer fell exhausted, raving in his slumber, hurled at the billows grim reproaches without number. Be cursed, O deep for evermore! Mad was I ever to adore ocean, first still and subtly charming, next treacherous, deceitful, grievous, harming. The sea arrives in mythologic guise, with human accents, thus replies, Not than thy view could well be stranger, to cross my waters is ne'er frightful, brings no danger, but when the frothy main is moved to fierceness vast, twere right the blame on Aeolus to cast. Enraged he grants me never quiet, if thou believest me not, test for thyself his riot i'm motionless as earth when storms are past o oh, send thy ships abroad when winds no longer last fine counsel i must say and nothing's newer yet sail without a wind we've need of something truer chapter sixty two three peasants three peasants in a village for the night they had in petersburg as drivers stored up a treasure though toiling hard yet tasted pleasure now homeward travelling rejoiced in thoughts of leisure but as no peasant loves to sleep with stomach light they hesitate then ask their host to give them supper oh how luxurious the fare there was some cabbage soup not much of it to share and a loaf's lower part the host had used the upper twas always more in petersburg but why complain to lie down hungry causes pain. At once devoutly crossed himself each peasant, grew busied with the present. However, one of them, of notions free, quickly perceiving there was not enough for three, without for further cheer applying, remarked, upon a blithe and ready wit relying, My lads, concerning Thomas, have you heard the news? Ill luck for him, conscribed, to go he can't refuse. Conscribed? 
How? What? Just so, a Chinese war's the rumor. China must pay us tribute, help the tea consumer. The other two began to argue and decide. They sometimes read a journal, talked about it, but as they had not seen one, now knew well without it who should command the tactics to be tried, the clever fellows, warming well in conversation, discussed reports and many a nation, whereat our friend with joy was overpowered, for while they showed how highly they were mettled and moves of armies settled, he, lifting not his voice, the bread and soup devoured. On that which he's idly swelling, a foolish man, descants more readily than all. What will occur in countries, large or small, he is disposed to bawl. You will see, while other things enthrall, is burnt before his eyes, his dwelling. Chapter 63 The Swan, the Pike, and the Crayfish When among partners concord there is not, successful issues scarce are got, and the result is loss, disaster, and repining. A crayfish, swan, and pike combining, resolve to draw a cart and freight. In harness soon their efforts ne'er abate. However much they work, the load to stir refuses. It seems to be perverse, with self-will vast endowed. The swan makes upward for a cloud, the crayfish falls behind, the pike the river uses. To judge of each one's merit lies beyond my will. I know the cart remains there still. CHAPTER 64 THE WOLF AND THE STORK The world's aware that wolves are greedy, a wolf once scorning bones, to swallow was over-speedy. But for his fault, he by misfortune dire atones, nigh meets a sudden end from choking. He struggles hard, can scarcely draw his breath, in horror sees impending death. A stork arrives, and her, with wild invoking, he somehow brings at last his hapless plight to know. Into the horrid throat below the bird her beak sets deeply, extracts the bone, but aiding not her patient cheaply, she for her skill cannot reward forego. You joke, snapped out the monster dryly. Your trouble? Be more grateful, value highly, that t'was to you vouchsafed to draw your awkward beak, and dismal countenance from jaws in no way weak. Don't linger, friend, tis time for action. In future have a care, or I'll have satisfaction. Chapter 65 The Oracle a certain heathen shrine possessed a wooden god, wanted at times to give assurances prophetic or counsel clear and energetic. A figure wonderful yet odd, with gold and silver ornamented, it stood with finery contented and sacrifices hung, with supplications cloaked and clouds of incense choked. All trust the oracle, and blindly, until, O oh marvel and O oh shame, its sudden issues edicts tame, responding often senselessly, unkindly, when now a supplicant for helpful news applies, he gets but folly, ignorance, or lies. And as the oracle thus blunders, it surely comes about that everybody wonders. Men have averred the idol's hollow and whene'er it speaks is heard the voice of some one hidden, and so, filled by a being astute, the god can wisdom show, but ne'er a fool within should go, he'll nonsense talk, should be forbidden. Tis said, is't true, there were of old within the court such judges, as well advised by poor but clever drudges, a wisdom that seemed native could unfold. CHAPTER 66 THE SLANDERER AND THE SNAKE The view that devils are defective in niceties of justice calls for a corrective. For instance, as to right, they pass through moods reflective, concerning which I something strange can tell. Once on a time it came to pass in hell that to a snake 
to march in solemn rites it fell behind a slanderer with rivalry deep rooted the pair disputed to whom belonged the honor of the chief advance always in hell ill deeds the status much enhance arch fiends precede such is the ordinance now in this contest keen hot enmity was nourished the slanderer his wicked tongue before the viper flung while fiercely in return the snake his body flourished and hissing that he would not suffer disrespect strove to supplant by methods indirect the slanderer well nigh had lost the best position so help of great beelzebub obtained who from the hideous serpent gained submission fast drove the crawling reptile back saying i no way will your character attack yet first you cannot go your deeds are not as black tis true your bite is swiftly mortal thus you are dangerous when near but ere your venom's in the very portal of your fell jaws while far abroad men trembling fear those slanders which so deeply sear that neither waves nor lofty cliffs confer resistance safe distance as this man's words can cause the strong to quake you'll follow after him nor strive to overtake in hell the slanderer's more honored than the snake chapter sixty seven the ape however hard you toil fame will from you recoil bring you nor gratitude nor leisure unless you offer others gain or use or pleasure a peasant drove his plough at dawn with might and main unceasing labored nobly employed his time and brawn great beads of moisture closely neighbored unto his manly brow were drawn many a friend in turn approaches wishing good day and length of life and then upon the scene encroaches a little ape in whom this jealous hope is rife to push a log thus to fruition assist a worthy effort of ambition with will and curious noises shrill choosing a sapling on the hill the ape it here and there embraces now hither drags it thither places eager some purpose to fulfill a while she pants then waits scarce breathing but hears no meed of praise no smiles her face are wreathing small wonder poor and senseless thing you strove with honest wish but did not profit bring chapter sixty eight the sack an ante-room's dark end attend an empty sack here lying for footmen coarse and low a humble thing to wipe their boots on lowly was supplying but oh our sack to honor flying being with glorious ducats filled lay in a chest with all resentful feelings stilled the master likes his bag to cherish himself must guard the treasure well upon it never fell the softest breath of wind nor any fly could perish now all the town could sing its praises of the thing a visitor for the proprietor arriving will soon about it pleasant discourse be contriving and if the sack shall stay exposed the eyes of each have soon his love for it disclosed so who by lucky chance sits nigh it assuredly will smooth or pat as if to try it now learning that it's won from all such high respect the sack with pride grows heated wiseacre like conceited must open conversations mightiness effect have views on many a topic trounces one as a fool or fit for school and nearly everything denounces all greedy listen to it though it nonsense talks oh never in attention balks its flow resistless let conversation turn on mighty gold and people pause their breath then hold never by any chance seem bored or listless long did the sack enjoy such honor dwell select always did folks caress it so long as in it ducats lingered men would bless it last empty it was ousted met with sheer neglect 
we hope we have not many by mischance offended how numberless the sacks among financiers lacks who once perhaps as waiters at some inn attended they now make sharp attacks as gamblers to acquire the money of another would ever riches win even defraud a brother with such a crew to-day are counts and princes both not loath to be on terms in fine homes stately within whose ante-room these money-bags till lately ne'er dared to stand they now play whist my friends who once could scarce exist and now as millionaires exhibit yourselves proudly should come misfortune's outlook black i tell the simple truth and loudly the day you fall they'll drive you forth just like the sack chapter sixty nine the boy and the snake it chanced a boy who thought to catch an eel snatched at a serpent soon perceived his error and blanched beneath excess of terror the snake imagining what dread the child must feel said slowly listen if you do not grow up wiser your boldness may not save from peril always spare god will forgive to-day but he continues ere a fool's chastiser chapter seventy the peasant in trouble one night a cunning thief brought on a peasant cruel grief crossing the yard the storerooms entered examining the walls the ceilings and the floors the rogue relentlessly explores keeps every thought in profit grossly centred this peasant who lay down in wealth alas awoke without a single penny destined a tramp to beg from many may none of us so lose in property and health ere long poor fellow deeply dejected he visits kin and trusty friends to gain through sympathy amends can you not help me ask he ruin now impends then quickly by his tale affected they freely offer counsel wise says gossip cart light of my eyes you should not to our faces happiness have boasted alluded to your means and Klyemich adds dear soul my favor to you leans in future have the storerooms near the cottage posted brothers such prattle me astounds tis foca now must reason to blame the storeroom sight is treason my dove keep in the yard some lively hounds except from me this puppy he is clever joshka's his mother and in sorrow i would never even upon her frown much less her litter drown briefly from comrades old and blood relations kindly words of a thousand sorts jostle each other blindly folk to him list but no way by their deeds the wretched man assist end of section seven recording by kevin davidson www.blogordie.com Chapters seventy one to eighty of Krilov's Fables by Ivan Andreevich Krilov, selected and translated by C. Fillingham Coxwell, M. D. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Kevin Davidson. Chapter seventy one The Pike and the Cat. A fighting pike had strange desires, leaving its haunts revealed ambitious fires perhaps was sick of fishy fare would choose a better saying that habits past the future should not fetter i begged a neighbor puss of large and pleasant kind to lead it gently when he went a-praying together they might some mice find all right the tom replies an interest deep displaying you happily bear the task in mind for us you know the work is nice and cheerful if victims find it tearful we steal about of peril never fearful how good of you my friend so i'm to catch some mice no more for me will perch suffice and now tis time let's go and take our places tom soon fulfils his utmost wish and hastes to see how fares it with the fish 
which open-mouthed reclines distressed and feverish rats on its tail have left their traces alas the foolish thing is almost hope beyond so the cat hurries it with vigor to a pond this lesson is sound teaching should be far-reaching henceforth o pike be wise on land might come a grim surprise chapter seventy two the leaves and the roots in summer hues arrayed and throwing o'er a dell deep shade fluttering leaves to zephyrs whispered lightly vaunted their growth prolific greenness pure twas thus they questioned with a bearing sprightly does not our beauty form the valley's noblest lure do we not clothe the tree with verdure clinging adorn the shape that bold outflinging sends shadows wide and far so singing we truth reveal and practice no deceit who guards the herd from sultry heat on worn-out passer-by bestows a kind protection blesses with helpful cool and calm coy shepherdesses dancing to perfection here from each foe secure and every false alarm sweet nightingales agree to charm but sharp winds ne'er a curtain relieves us from your force tis certain o oh, leaves you render us no single word of thanks here said as if from underground a voice not loudly tis strange that you should boast so shamelessly and proudly high o'er these earthy banks how dare you deck yourself with specious glamour the leaves keep silence and excuses cannot stammer o oh, hark and learn that we ere digging in the dark bring nourishment do you not really know us we are the mighty roots some gratitude then show us boast gently at the proper hour always remember please this difference in our power only a while in spring are new-born leaves appearing but ever roots their course are steering else grows nor tree nor leaf nor flower chapter seventy three the two casks down rolled two casks of wine one full but void the other its brother the first air slow and noiseless liked its easy motion the second a devotion evinced to sound and roar was by each crash upbuoyed and not annoyed when quick in fear a passer-by who gained a notion in time of what was coming stepped aside however thunderous its stride its worth was not enough to vindicate its pride the man who of his deeds would talk without cessation awakes not admiration but a soul capable can silently fulfil inspired by worthy plans is often still maturing without noise and yet completely discreetly chapter seventy four the parishioner once in a church a pastor who looked on plato as of eloquence a master discoursed before his flock concerning worthy deeds a speech mellifluous of perfect form proceeds to treat a purest truth with art appearing artless as by a golden chain to heaven are lifted thoughts of hearers even heartless and all perceive the world is full of projects vain the orator has finished preaching and yet his listeners stay being to glorious skies borne by the magic power of wondrous lofty teaching while pearly drops escaping flood their eyes and now the congregation leaves the temple holy how i his gifts admire says one man to the next in modest tone and lowly what sweetness touched with fire such richness every heart to virtue has deflected but neighbor you by it seem little affected your cheek displays methinks no single tear have you not understood yes entertain no fear but with this parish and folk here i sir in no way am connected chapter seventy five the monkey and the spectacles 
A monkey shrewd and old, growing in eyesight weaker, had understood from many a speaker that though her malady was not of serious kind, twere well some spectacles to find, and therefore for a pair she soon became a seeker. She turned the things in this way that, first placed them on her tail, next from her head must pick them, or took a sniff, at times would gently lick them, then almost at the glasses spat. "'Oh, let them perish,' says she, "'and he is a fool that praises such a paltry tool. They recommended me to take them, but I've no wish for such poor toys. Of use could never hope to make them.' And down they go with fearful noise, for she's determined now to break them. Chapter 76 The Raven and the Fox This truth within the heart is graven. All flattery is false, and so there's no excuse. If listeners succumb when flatterers seduce, Upon a little fir-tree lightly hopped a raven That wished to breakfast at her ease, and carried in her mouth a piece of fragrant cheese. But while she pondered, then a morsel tasted, a fox, adjudged the chance too perfect to be wasted, was taken captive by the cheesy scent. On looking up, no further on his journey went, the rogue on tiptoe to the fir-tree slow approaches. Upon the bird's attention sly encroaches, and gently says, in accents low and clear, O songster, exquisite and dear, your eyes are soft with love and pity. I humbly bow to one so pretty. Ne'er have I seen such feathers, such a beak, O queen of all the birds, but let me hear you speak. Or rather, deign to sing, enjoy a moment's leisure and charm the world with tones delightful beyond measure. Pour forth fine notes, my gracious treasure. The raven held her breath, and nearly died from choking, and then, as if a wild ambition in her burned, she opened wide her mouth for harsh, discordant croaking, and the fox gained the cheese his cunning skill had earned. Chapter 77 the funeral of old in pharaoh land a strange custom persisted of paying mourners fees to weep and loud lament at any funeral solemn magnificent once for pretentious obsequies enlisted a crowd of honest folk bewailed with ceaseless din the loss of him that leaving woes diurnal would find in realms infernal a purge for sin Behold, a stranger, deeming these signs external, justly betrayed but relative sincere regret, said, Friends, oh, surely you were now with joy transported, if unto magic I resorted. I am a wizard, and can miracles beget, by means of incantations easily provided, which make the dead revive at once. Father, delight us so, one uttered in response, adding, Another matter we would like decided. His breath no more shall last after five days are past. As no advantage followed when this man was living, a long existence were unwise. Too, when he dies, some will commands for further grief be giving. Chapter 78 The Division Some honest merchants once had reached a wise decision they would collect the profits of their trade about to make a last division would meet with cheerful smiles and nothing leave unpaid opposing interests bring collision as to the goods and money grows a hubbub dire then suddenly is bellowed house afire be quick yourselves take care of do not an instant wait cries one though danger well aware of we must accounts investigate and while a second shouts, "'Hand over now my share of the thousand pounds!' His voice despairingly resounds, "'But I've had nothing, though figures are conclusive!' A third more rudely screams, "'No, no, they are elusive! Tell me what this is for, and why!' Oblivious of the warning cry, they strangely long remained near peril coasted, until at last the flames shot high, 
and every one, with all the property, was roasted. Chapter 79 The Ass and the Nightingale To a sweet nightingale, an ass, directs a suppliant word. Oh, give me, friend, a hearing. Tis said that you in song are foremost soul endearing. I would a judgment pass, myself, could form by listening a notion wherefore your skill arouses such commotion. The nightingale, to show his quality, began. Trilling and whistling ran, or up and down in countless ways, the deftest notes controlling, now altered his harmonious plan, echoed a distant reed quickly and subtly rolling, now languished through the grove with cadences cajoling, all heed the slightest sound of such a dainty, perfect singer. The breezes still themselves, no other bird notes linger. Herds by the spell are bound. The silent shepherd stands, himself consoling with ecstasy profound, neglects the shepherdess with whom he's idly strolling. The ass would scarce at once the warbler's feeling shock. Quite good, he brays, a not unpleasing ditty, and yet I feel for you some pity. Obtain, oh, do not mock, instruction from our cock. I hold in singing he's omniscient, so perhaps you might grow in time proficient. Astonished by such words, the little nightingale fluttered and flew whither no critic should prevail. Chapter 80 The Frog and the Ox a frog that in a field was staring at an ox dared to compare herself with such a bulky creature. Oft envy vile at reason mocks. Stretching she hoped to swell in body, limb, and feature, and of a comrade asked, Am I not as great as he? By no means, friend. Your figure is than his far smaller. Oh, prithee look again. I've widened and am taller. Do not you see an alteration wrought? To that I'll not agree. Examine now. Unchanged, the frog, intent on trying, persisted, till the fool, dreaming to grow in size, tiny and mighty equalize, burst with her efforts, and sank helpless dying. End of chapters 71 to 80 Recording by Kevin Davidson www dot blog or die dot com chapters eighty one to eighty six of Krylov's fables by Ivan Andreevich Krylov selected and translated by C. Fillingham Coxwell M. D. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Kevin Davidson. Chapter eighty one. THE ELEPHANT AND THE PUG An elephant, mid shouts and laughter, was led along the street, and, as when in our towns a spectacle we meet, behind the wondrous beast some gapers followed after. But wheresoe'er he went, ever a little pug before him jumped, was now perverse and naughty, barking with condescension haughty, now snapping gave a vicious tug. Oh, neighbor, cease, you ask for trouble, a spitz dog warned her. Ah, you shamelessly redouble your din vociferous, but he has unconcerned not turned, nor notice when you loudest whine or spring your highest. No, says the pug, in manner driest, my spirit soars, though thou decriest, tis something I can win attention through practising from risk abstention tis well that other dogs should mention the pug is not of us the least she mocks a mighty beast chapter eighty two the lamb a lambkin straying is bent a trick on playing creeps in a wolf-skin amongst the flock hopes at his frightened fellow lambs to mock the dogs spy out the foolish jester Prepare to slay the cruel wood infester, they spring upon the foe and bear him to the ground. Ah, sooner than the lamb a chance to breathe has found, they strive to tear his fragile form to pieces. 
till at the shepherd's call the fearful onslaught ceases. No joke it is to feel a dog's sharp-pointed fangs, the madcap on this sad occasion totters and seeks the pen without persuasion, and there falls weak and faint and knows unnumbered pangs, a long while feebly groans, though speaking never. Oh, if a lamb were surely wise, he would assume a wolfish guise on no account whatever. CHAPTER Eighty Three, THE STEED AND HIS RIDER A rider once had given his horse such perfect schooling, obedience strict was gained with little ruling. He lifted ne'er the whip, nor bridle stirred, controlled his steed without a word. "'The reins are useless, brave and splendid creature,' the owner whispered with fond look, to show the world a novel feature, ere mounting on his horse the bridle from him took. The steed forgot his master, though slow at first, soon went a little faster, o'erjoyed, high tossed his glorious head, and proudly his mane shaking, pranced for his soul to life was waking, by liberty upbuoyed. What means it, O oh, mad dream of freedom unalloyed, and change unguessed, past ways forsaking, dances his blood and shines his glance, as if a fire, is heard no single sound unfelt the rider is hurried o'er the fields with swiftness dire by one who knows no guider vainly the luckless horseman sought with trembling hand this wildness to withstand would fix the bridle was unskilful the steed ere grew more strangely wilful at last could speed along masterless and dismanned then like a raging storm he hasted on on nor stayed his rash career but to a deep ravine his course must steer death's bitterness so tasted the man his grief thus showed poor horse said he twas i that brought thee sadness and evil fate had i not once withheld the bridle's weight thou ne'er hadst warmed to madness nor thrown thy master from thy side nor perished in a fierce and newborn pride. Chapter eighty four The Finch and the Pigeon A little finch being caught within a horrid trap uses its tiny force and pitifully flutters. Then a young pigeon jeering at her spitefully mutters Art not ashamed in daylight didst not see the shutters for me were never such mishap I guarantee and bold maintain it and yet the speaker can't when tangled in the snare explain it o oh, pigeon now to laugh at others trouble spare chapter eighty five the snake and the lamb a snake beneath a faggot hidden raging denounced the world entire was blessed with ne'er a feeling higher than the envenomed hate by his own nature bidden nearby a little lamb at unsuspecting play saw not the hideous reptile in the way a sudden the snake leapt fiercely his teeth implanted and the poor victim fell and trembled moaned and panted the fatal poising coursing free tortured her and she cried what have i done to thee who knows perhaps you hither cunningly intruded so hissed the serpent loud would strike me even slay therefore in cautious mood i bit without delay ah no the lamb gasped forth in death thou art deluded chapter eighty six the grandee off tossed and turned a fevered ruler despite physicians grew not cooler forsook his couch to seek the land which Pluto swaves. Finished, in short, his earthly days, and soon in hell, before the judge's dais falling, was asked his place of birth, the nature of his calling. I breathed in Persia first, an honored satrap dwelt, yet from my youthful days but little vigor felt, when faced with any fresh transaction, endorsed my secretary's action. What did you do then? 
slept, drank, and ate, signed documents before me set. Send him to paradise. But wherefore, what's the reason? So ventured Mercury, with boldness nearly treason. Said Achis, O brother thou, unto the dead man shrewdness must allow. He knew that nature cannot all alike endow. He neither willed to cause misfortune, nor would for complex tasks importune. If he had brought afflictions vast, you swiftly would complaints have muttered, Into high heaven he has passed, because he never folly uttered. In court I lately heard a judge so brief, concise, I said, His turn will come to dwell in paradise. End of chapter 86 Recording by Kevin Davidson www.blogordie.com End of Krilov's Fables by Ivan Andreevich Krilov Selected and translated by C. Fillingham Coxwell, M.D.